Mr. Advisor, how are we today? Okay, just one second. Yes, Don. Uh, Mr. Chairman, just a, a quick housekeeping item. Uh, the governor has submitted 17 letters. They're available in hard copy in your top, um, top drawer. And there top is the eight, uh, the top shelf there. Oh, yeah. <laughs> and uh, <clears throat> below them are about 41 copies of the um, ARPA explanations. Those have been emailed to you previously, but the hard copies right. are there for everyone. Thank you. Oh, weekend reading, I guess. Are the letter, do we have the letters online? Uh, Mr. Chairman, we do. And they're under uh, executive letters, I believe, which is a subdirectory under agency budget requests. Or no, it's, a, it's its own subdirectory. And Mr. Chairman, the listening, yeah. audience, the listening audience can find the governor's letters at sbd.wyo.gov. One nice. more time for those who are slow of hearing and pan. SBD.WIO.GOV. All righty then. Anything else, Don? Okay. All right. So again, welcome. So who's uh, who's, who's who's running the show today, Mr. Chief of Staff? Is that you? You're gonna you're gonna give the introduction and turn it over to Rennie? <laughs> Mr. Chairman. <laughs> yeah, that's. Uh... That is going to be the, the pecking order today. Wait a minute, someone down there is missing a mask. <laughs> <laughs> Who is she? I took it off, so I wouldn't forget, sir. <laughs> All right. All right. Thank you, sir. Um, and good afternoon, Mr. Chairman and members of the committee. My name is Buck McVeigh. I'm the uh, governor's chief of staff. I'm joined today uh, as well by Rennie McKay. Uh, our policy director and Erica Ligurski, senior policy advisor. And in addition, there's a variety of uh, uh, other uh, uh, pertinent staff here that will be available uh, to answer questions as well. But Mr. Chairman, the, I, I, in addition to these uh, key folks here, uh, Director Hibbard and his staff, uh, I just would like to thank my my staff, uh, certainly Rennie's policy staff and, and my administrative staff for the immense uh, effort and immense amount of work that they've put forward in, in getting these letters uh, done. So uh, we couldn't have done, I couldn't have begun to have done it uh, without their steadfast and, and uh, tireless effort. So um, as, uh, as uh, Mr. Richards said, uh, we have 17 letters that we will discuss this afternoon. I will present the first uh, uh, 15 and then the uh, letters 16 and 17 directly relate to, to the uh, ARPA funding. And so with that, Mr. Chairman, I will start off with uh, letter number one, um, which is the Department of Health Superflex Authority. Two years ago, the governor recommended the use of Superflex authority and reversion carry forward to fund the requested positions and the 100 series labor and benefit modification at the state hospital and the Life Resource Center. However, due largely to the onset of the COVID-19 pandemic, the department's ability to fully implement the staffing plan at both facilities was delayed. Not knowing the full extent of the pandemic or how long the current federal policy changes will continue in the future, the governor is recommending once again, allowing the Department of Health to keep its 1.7 million standard budget and reauthorize the use of the 29 additional positions that were approved in the 21-22 uh, biennium for use at the newly constructed uh, WDH facilities. And Mr. Chairman, the governor also recommends giving the Department of Health super flex authority and reverse and carry forward authority uh, from budget fiscal year 2021 into budget fiscal year 2023. Um, in addition, the governor recommends uh, using the uh, department uh, reversions if available for these for this following uh, uh, one-time restorations of certain step two and step three reductions. 
And the first one, Mr. Chairman, is a one-time uh, restoration of step three reduction in the uh, children's mental health waiver and care managed entity programs, which is uh, unit uh, 462 for 2,953,405 uh, dollars in, antici in anticipated general fund reversions and 2.9, uh, or I guess the same amount for federal funds. The second uh, is one-time restoration of the step three reduction in the Medicaid budget cut restoration in order to meet maintenance of effort requirement for ARPA home and community-based service funding. And that's unit 485 for $10,218,036 in anticipated general fund revenue or reversions and the same amount in federal funds. And then the third one is one-time restoration of step two reduction in the Medicaid budget cut restoration comprehensive waiver. And that's unit 485 for $967,450 in anticipated budget uh, or anticipated general fund reversions and the same amount uh, uh, for federal funds. And Mr. Chairman, the, the governor is extending his recommendations for these three now, because in the fall, uh, fall budget building process, the original estimate for the Department of Health's uh, reversions were, were more conservative uh, than the current estimate of 76 million, which was recently calculated by the Department of Health and the stand, uh, State Budget Division. So this provides more opportunities to lessen the step two and step three uh, budget impacts Mr. Uh, Chair. for Wyoming constituents. Go ahead. I do have a question, um, Buck. So for example, for <clears throat> number two or number three, because, it, because you're talking about one-time dollars, and it, it appears to me that both of these um, are to some extent COVID related and what's gonna happen in the future. Why wouldn't we then substitute COVID dollars or ARPA dollars for these dollars rather than general fund? Go ahead. Or could we? Mr. Kevin, Chairman. Kevin's gonna speak. In reality, what's taking place here is the provision on FMAP on the lower match part of COVID is providing that $76 million for us. So we wanna leverage that as well as the intelligent amount leveraging the rest of ARPA dollars. So essentially we are leveraging ARPA funds. Yes, go ahead. So, uh, Mark, on, on these, so we've got this enhanced Medicaid rate that, that, that our standard budget is built on the standard rate when we, when we pass that. So we're within it to be maybe 10% over the course by virtue of these, of these, of these funds that will then be used and as, re, as reversion dollars because we replace that 10% for part of the, of the general fund, which gives us this, this ability to do that. My question, so last year, these reductions were, were step three reductions were put back in with the instruction, of course, to reconsider them. And that brings us to this point. What I don't understand is in the language there, just above the, um, just above the, the item, the bullet number one, it says, I recommend using department reversions if available for these things. So tell me the mechanics of that, how that works. If I'm a provider, do I provide services and then wait and see if the funds are available? Or can you help walk me through how that, how that wording, um, how, how do we get around, what do we do? Uh, Mr. Chairman, Representative Larson, that's a, that, that is, I, I, I see the, uh, I see what you're seeing there, and, and that is a, a question that maybe I will, I will refer to, to uh, Director Hibbert on. So we're flipping coins here, uh, Director. Black mask. Wins. Go ahead, Stephen. Mr. Chairman, uh, members of the committee, again, Stephen Johansson with the Department of Health. 
Um, the, the answer to that question, Representative Larson, is these restorations would essentially put the money back in our budget. The source that we're funding them with is just not an appropriation. It's a reversion carry forward, as, as you know. So the providers wouldn't be, if this were approved, would not be in limbo waiting for that money. We would be on the hook to provide it. The language here that says if the reversions are available really uh, refers to how things could turn around in the last five months of this biennium, that that 76 million we project might not be as high. If that happened, which I don't anticipate it will, we would handle that uh, budget deficit in the supplemental session. The department would be able to cover these areas in the first six months of the new biennium um, quite easily. Thank you. Okay. All right, continue. Very good, Mr. Chairman, that, uh, uh, that concludes this letter and we offer this uh, recommendation for, uh, for the consideration of this committee. All right, thank you. Any other further questions? All right, continue. Mr. Chairman, letter number two uh, relates to the Department of Corrections Superflex. On January 13th of uh, 2020, the governor submitted the Department of uh, Correction Superflex letter number nine, which recommended allowing the Department of Corrections to continue to use Superflex authority in the management of its budget to assist with the retention, recruitment, facility repair, out-of-state inmate placements, and to address hepatitis C. State's been able to conserve approximately 320 million uh, in general funds by partially funding the Department of Corrections and the Department of Health with ARPA funds. However, we believe that the Superflex Authority is still a needed tool for these agencies. Therefore, the governor uh, is, is recommending continuation of the Superflex Authority. And Mr. Chairman, that, uh, that concludes That's my- that. <laughs> Yeah, on that Okay, one. any questions? All right, continue. Thank you. Letter number three, Mr. Chairman, uh, is the Wyoming Military Department Capital Construction Projects. And this letter is meant to clarify the fiscal year 23-24 budget proposal for the Wyoming Military Department that was presented to you during the governor's budget presentation on November 15th. Our office was, was quite frankly unaware of two out of cycle requests that the military department briefed you on at their December 13th hearing. Both projects require appropriations of 100% federal spending authority in order to secure the federal funding awaiting our actions and to begin construction. And Mr. Chairman, those, those projects, uh, the, they are referenced as project numbers three and four, the Evanston Cemetery expansion and the Camp Guernsey ASP administration. Actually Evansville Cemetery expansion, but. Well, what did I say? Evanston. You said Evanston, Evansville. Gosh, okay. Although Ev Ev Evanston would probably correct. like to have one of those too. So, yeah. Evansville. Yeah, thank you for that correction, Mr. Chair. <laughs> Project numbers uh, one and two uh, for the Camp Guernsey Barracks were previously submitted to you through the normal budget process, and the State Construction Office briefed you about these on December 7th. Um, all four projects are requested to proceed with level three design and construction. Uh, Mr. Chairman, the governor uh, directed the military department to review these uh, two new requests at uh, the state building commission uh, meeting uh, just last, last week in January. The department briefed them earlier this week and, and uh, the SBC subsequently approved these projects. So the governor is therefore recommending the appropriation of projects three and four in the total amount of $4,279,180, uh, $4,279,183 in federal spending authority. This in addition to the previously recommended 12 million, uh, uh, this is in addition to the previously recommended $12 million uh, in federal funds for the Camp Guernsey Barracks. Um, and the governor, Mr. Chairman, also recommends that projects one, three, and four become effective immediately to secure federal funding as soon as possible and preserve the majority of the 2022 construction season to advance the projects this calendar year. So, Mr. Chairman, we offer this recommendation for the consideration of, of your committee. 
All right, thank you. Questions? All right, continue. Thank you, thank you. Um, uh, next letter, letter number four, employee compensation. Uh, Mr. Chairman, during the governor's budget presentation, he mentioned that he has heard from virtually every agency uh, about the strife they're having to attract and retain employees. Turnover and vacancies are straining the, the ability for the state to provide these services, the services that, the services that, that Wyoming people demand and quite frankly have come to expect. Um, and, and frankly, with the state, from what we have seen, is hemorrhaging its talent and experience. We're not only losing our folks to the private sector, but, but now uh, we've seen instances where we're losing to other state governments as well. A recent survey conducted by ANI shows that 38% of uh, state employees who responded to the survey reported the need to have a second job. And there was 3% in that survey that reported that they, that they must avail themselves to uh, assistance from, from programs like TANF and SNAP and others. Um, what we know here, Mr. Chairman, is both private businesses and the public sector are increasing wages to attract and retain talent and account for inflation. And meanwhile, we, uh, it's a state and compensating our employees at below uh, 2017 peer market. And the fact that the locals now and, and uh, local governments and private sectors are, are able to do this and they're, and they're doing it uh, to raise salaries, uh, it's kind of exacerbating the dilemma that we're having here in hiring and retaining uh, quality staff. And as it states in the letter, we believe we're not asking for the moon here, rather we're simply asking that we move employees closer to the market and implement merit pay that has really never been uh, uh, fully implemented or, or partially th that I know of. The general funds uh, compensation request is for approximately $54 million. And, and Mr. Chairman, this includes the executive branch, the University of Wyoming, Wyoming Community College Commission, and the judicial branch. It also includes public television, judicial conduct and ethics, business council, and the Wyoming Energy Authority. And I know that you've, you folks have been briefed uh, uh, about this and provided uh, details from, from uh, ANI. So with that, Mr. Chairman, um, we ask for the committee's favorable recommendation for this proposal. All right, thank you. Questions? All right, seeing none, continue. Letter five. Thank you very much. Letter number five is uh, the ECA, the external cost adjustment. Governor concurs with both the um, legislature's joint uh, education and appropriations committee recommendations for the energy and educational materials funding model categories. The information provided by consultants appear to indicate uh, generally that Wyoming uh, has largely lost the competitive advantage it once enjoyed with regard to education salaries. However, teaching wages uh, remain high relative to other Wyoming occupations. Therefore, the governor believes that a cautious approach would best balance the need for efficient use of taxpayer funds with, uh, with the need to ensure that Wyoming's education salaries remain competitive. So with that, Mr. Chairman, the governor is recommending an, an ECA of 37 million, which is just for the, the, the fiscal year 2023. He then would like to revisit the second half of the ECA during the supplemental budget process next year. And so Mr. Chairman, we offer this recommendation for the consideration. Of your All right, thank you. Questions? All right, thank you. Letter six. Thank you. Letter number six is, uh, uh, Fire Borrowing Authority, <clears throat> and I think as we all have seen throughout the West over the last uh, few years, wildfires have had a significant impact or, and, and, and significant impacts in, in communities and, and in states, uh, and Wyoming needs to be able to react quickly to combat fires. In the past, we have issued two governor's letters, one uh, to request authority to borrow funds to uh, to be used for wildfire fighting efforts. 
in the case that we deplete reserves during the biennium. And then the other to replenish the, the Wyoming Forestry Division's fire suppression account as needed. And Mr. Chairman, in this, bud, in this year's budget, uh, we recommended approval of a one-time general fund increase to the Wyoming Forestry Division's fire suppression account balance of $20 million. The governor is also recommending that the legislature continue the governor's borrowing authority of up to $20 million from the LSRA. Uh, the borrowing authority that has been used in the past has proven to be critical in, in order for the state to respond rapidly to an extreme fire event or the events that could be above the amount in other contingency accounts. Mr. Chairman, we offer this recommendation for the consideration of the committee. Thank you, questions? So going back to this for during there, just so people don't get confused, there are three separate 20,000 masks between these layers in the budget. There's the 20 million in the, I said 20,000, 20 million in the fire suppression count, 20 million borrowing authority, and then there's, it's not in this letter, but we've talked about it before it's in the budget proposal of 20 million for the public emergency account. So just let, just, just some people get confused, but there are three separate 20 million uh, requests in here. So just, I'm just pointing that out. So thank you. Yes, sir. Thank you. Okay. There's no questions there. Uh, I will move on to letter number seven. Letter number seven. And that is the Federal Natural Resource Account, FNERPA. And Mr. Chairman, as Wyoming continues to engage with the federal government to um, defend Wyoming's priorities, interests, and way of life, we find it's more apparent than ever that when it comes to natural resources, there are starkly different values and approaches between Wyoming and Washington, D.C. One of the budget cuts our office made in 2020 was a reduction uh, to the FNERPA. We asked for the authority to spend down the balance of the account and, and to not receive a new appropriation. Given that revenue has picked up, however, uh, as evidenced in, in the January Craig uh, report that we heard about today, and this largely thanks to our, our three key energy commodities, coal, uh, oil, and natural gas, we are asking to restore that funding with an additional $1 million from the general fund for NERPA. And Mr. Chairman, this would be on top of the 900,000 in the spending authority from the account we requested in our, in our standard budget. Additionally, one of the first large scale projects or, or opportunities Wyoming has for input with the federal administration is with the Black Hills National Forest Plan revision. By initiating the forest plan revision process, the U.S. Forest Service provides Wyoming the opportunity to have meaningful input in the process. The governor is committed to supporting Wyoming's engagement in the Black Hills National Forest Plan revision if the engagement is driven locally by a coalition of stakeholders and if South Dakota is committed to working with Wyoming. Therefore, he is also requesting an additional $1 million to the FNERPA uh, expressly for the Black Hills National Forest Plan revision and the development of a community alternative plan. This would start in 2022, Mr. Chairman. However, because the Black Hills National Forest is spread across two states, this funding should be accessible to a, co only should be accessible to a coalition of local governments formally joined together to participate in the process. And again, if South Dakota also commits to matching our funding commitment. The governor is also requesting that 140,000 be added to the budget of the Division of State Forestry. This would be applied to the Wyoming State Forestry Good Neighbor Revolving Account, which is in uh, Wyoming Statute 36-1-50 within the Office of State Lands and Investments budget. This proposal consists of 100,000 for, for the ability to contract, contract, excuse me, and the additional, and an additional 40,000 for travel. So, Mr. Chairman, that's, uh, we ask for the committee's favorable recommendation for this. Go ahead, Representative Larson. Let me understand when you say the proposal consists of 100,000 for the ability to contract. 
could you give me a little more definition of what you're referring to there? Is it a specific thing that they're working on or is it just flexibility to contract for the good neighbor, uh, to, for other good neighbor authority efforts? Go ahead, Randy. Mr. Chairman, I'll jump in here on for this one, Randy McKay, policy director. Um, that, that 100,000 would be for the state forestry department specifically to have a role. So the, the million would be for local um, governments uh, for its work in this community alternative building. But if we need expertise um, in terms of uh, bringing in the, the at the state level, um, that was our estimate for what the state would, would need to contribute and be able to contribute to the planning. So it would qualify as good neighbor because it's uh, good neighbor allows uh, only to be spent on national forests. So if just to, so, um, just to go back through. So what we had in I think in the budget there was there was nine hundred. So there's an additional million that's just basically uh, for whatever purposes Fenerpa account can be used for. But then you're asking for two restricted appropriations. One another another million that is not to pay for the local government's participation, but to provide resources for the local government to participate and pay the freight costs. So we're not gonna pay them for their tents, but we might we might assist with travel, might assist with expert, uh, expert analysis or studies, things like that. So we do want that, you do want that restricted in that regard and limited to the, only the bowling on the Black Hills. And then the, the, the 140,000, again, you still want you want that you want that you want that, but you want it restricted for use in the uh, in the good neighbor revolving account. So I don't understand that. Okay, Mr. Chairman, that's all correct. The nine hundred thousand was just only spending authority. That's uh, right. Um, right. So the the million for to go into the Fenerpa account, we think it now is a good time to 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 do that since there are additional revenues. So if that could last beyond this biennium because there are carryovers. So if we don't need it, um, it this would be a time to invest in the account. Yeah, and so then, the, the spending authority goes, and then restricted spending authority goes to million nine, right? Mr. Chairman, correct. For the biennium, it would be 1.9 unrestricted <laughs> Fenerpa, uh, under FNERPA requirements. But if it's not all spent, it would carry over in the future biennium. Got it. Letter eight. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. You're almost halfway home. <laughs> <laughs> Letter number eight, state parks and cultural resources, Governor Mead Portrait. Uh, Mr. Chairman, the governor is pleased to carry on the tradition of helping educate uh, future generations about the people who have served as Wyoming's governors. This is done at least in part by the collection of portraits of past governors that hang in the Capitol. These are extremely popular among the visitors to the Capitol and in, uh, quite frankly, inspirational to those who work in the Capitol. We've, uh, we have secured an artist who is ready and able to paint Governor Matthew H. Mead's portrait. Therefore, we are requesting $26,200 be allocated from the general fund to the Department of State Parks and Cultural Resources for this purpose. Mr. Chairman, we ask for the committee's favorable okay. request. This is every governor's favorite favorite request. Second favorite, second favorite <laughs> request. There's one more the governor's like more than this. So thank you. Make just make sure they, if, if we if assuming that this if this was approved, make sure they use the should side. Thank you, Mr. <laughs> yes, Mr. Vice President. I, I think my colleague from Teton County is pretty artistic. <laughs> I'm just wondering if he was planning on <clears throat> putting in a submission for this. I think that's I think this is legal under the Constitution. Let's resign. <laughs> <laughs> okay, letter nine. Thank you. Letter nine. Local governments. Mr. Chairman, the govern the governor is once again recommending the hundred and five million dollars in general funds for cities, towns, and counties. This was on, the prof on this profile presented in November and, and is confirmed with this letter. And that's simply it. So All right, ask thank for your you. Favorable recommendation. Letter 10. Letter number 10, State Engineer's Office Deputy Director position. Mr. Chairman, last year, uh, 
the last year's has been challenging for state agencies and those who rely on services of local governments uh, due to significant budget cuts. It is the governor's strong belief that managing Wyoming's water and being prepared for continuation of impacts from the west-wide drought is a dire need. And we need to recognize that last year's cuts went too far in the state engineer's office, specifically the reduction of the deputy state engineer position. And Mr. Chairman, this, this came to a head when our state engineer uh, stepped away suddenly in December. Uh, that really uh, came as quite a shock to us. And really with no deputy to serve as, as uh, the interim, we did not have a succession, a decent succession plan in place at that time. Fortunately, however, Mr. Brandon Gephardt, who was the director of the Wyoming Water Development Commission, had the necessary skill set and the ability to step forward to serve. And needless to say, the governor and his staff truly appreciates his willingness to take on uh, this new task. However, defending our state's water rights and, and ensuring Wyoming's interests are preserved in the future management of the Colorado, North Platte, and Snake Rivers are all essential services the state must provide. The governor is requesting that you. Um, restore the position, the deputy position and the funding for salary and benefits. To hire at the midpoint level, uh, this would require $328,990.26 from the general fund to the state engineer's office. And Mr. Chairman, we ask for the committee's favorable recommendation for this proposal. Okay, thank you. Mr. Chairman. Go ahead. I just want to clarify Mr. this this request is different from the position for a somewhat similar amount in Green River. This is a different position, is that right? Mr. Chairman, Representative okay. Stith, yes, sir, it is. Thanks. We're still uh, distinctly different from the analyst position that we're looking for in, uh, out west. Okay. Continue. Letter 11. Letter number 11, the Wyoming State Geological Survey. Mr. Chairman, the, the infrastructure bill appropriates billions of dollars to advance carbon capture, hydrogen, and nuclear development and infrastructure projects, all of which can and should be cited in Wyoming. In addition, the bill targets hundreds of millions of dollars towards the critical uh, minerals research, mine waste recycling, and a rare earth element processing demonstration project. The nation is recognizing the more we rely on uh, advanced personal uh, technology, uh, electric vehicles and mass production of wind and solar facilities, the more critical materials are in demand. The ability to meet the required match of some of these federal funds is limited, however, due to the reduced staff at the State Geological Survey. We are therefore at risk of losing federal funds. The other major change uh, <clears throat> since uh, the November budget submission, <clears throat> excuse me, is a continued improvement in our revenue forecast. Therefore, the governor is recommending that you approve this request for $201,435 in general fund dollars for the creation of an economic geologist, critical minerals position. And Mr. Chairman, we ask uh, for the committee's favorable consideration for this proposal. All right, thank you. Questions, thank you. Continue. Letter 12. Letter number 12. School of Energy Resources. The governor supports using general fund dollars made available through revenue replacement for a potential match to federal funds. The infrastructure bill appropriates billions of dollars that could be used for carbon capture, hydrogen, nuclear, and infrastructure projects that should be built in Wyoming. While we do, know, we do not know if and what the federal government will require from matching funds, the governor proposes having funds, those funds ready and available. The School of Energy Resources will need to keep policy and center of excellence personnel to help guide these projects to Wyoming. And so, Mr. Chairman, the, the governor is now requesting approval 
of the $1,170,000 in general fund that was originally requested by the SCR. This would allow them to keep the personnel at the Center for Energy Regulation and Policy Analysis focused on assisting state agencies in commenting on the flood of federal regulations that have been proposed and will continue to be proposed by the current administration. Without this funding, Mr. Chairman, the ability of the SER to support the state's efforts to apply for infrastructure projects, to analyze federal policies and provide comments supporting Wyoming interests will be curtailed, if not eliminated, just when we need it most. So Mr. Chairman, we ask the committee's favorable recommendation for this proposal. Thank you. Questions? All right, continue. Letter 13. Thank you. Letter number 13 is the Wyoming Energy Authority. The Wyoming Energy Authority is very similar to the SCR when it comes to the infrastructure bill and, and, uh, uh, and again, the, the January Craig report. The Wyoming Energy Authority was established to be a nimble state entity to identify, analyze, and promote energy related uh, industries and projects. However, the expertise of its staff is not limited to existing industries, but that, uh, but that is truly the base from which they will operate. The WEA does not have the appropriate staff to keep pace for what we expect the state will need during the next biennium. So therefore, Mr. Chairman, the governor is recommending an increase to the standard budget of $400,000 from general funds to be given to the WEA for the position for a position, and this position will assist private businesses interested in building energy-related projects in Wyoming. Uh, and this, uh, I will point out, this position will complement the existing WEA staff by managing all external corporate relationships, ensuring, ensuring that the uh, industry and the federal or state public partners receive guidance when considering energy related projects in Wyoming. And uh, this position will work closely with the Wyoming Business Council to promote its strategies for uh, the business to stay in Wyoming and that uh, new capital is deployed in the state creating new businesses and new jobs in a growing energy economy. So Mr. Chairman. Mr. Chairman. Go ahead, Representative Larson. So I understand what the letter's doing. I just don't see in the letter where you request a position. Mr. Chairman. I'm sorry, could you say that again, Representative Larson? I didn't catch that. Well, it, I, I, as I read the letter, I never see where it says, maybe somebody can point it out to me. I don't say it says we'd like to request a position or it says this position, but it never says where the position. Mr. Chairman and Representative Larson, we don't have a position. That's correct. WEA does not have a, hundred, uh, a 100 series uh, Thank you. Please. Yeah, got just it. contracts. Thank you. Appreciate that. Mm -hmm. All right. Thank you. Other questions? All right. Thank you. Just uh, out of curiosity, in the Thrive and Fly and the Thrive and Thrive Plan, it. Survive. Survive and Thrive Plan. Um, you've got you've got a um, you've got two million at, for, at UWSER. And I thought there was another number, another request of the, uh, the Special Projects Opportunity Management and Business Engagement at the $2 million, that's, that's the request, the $2 million, $2 million request there. Just, is there a, help us, help us understand the difference there. I don't, I'm assuming this isn't a duplicate request, so help us understand if you could the difference there. Mr. Chairman, thank you. Uh, very important relationship between them. So this is would be an ongoing request um, for this one. So this would be to, to add that position permanently to their the authority. Um, it, whereas the ARPA Drive and Thrive proposal recognizes that those are one-time dollars and uh, that especially with it with this is a time to, to beef up um, staff to be able to help both the private sector and to deal with these federal grants that are out there. So um, that we, we specifically did look at this proposal uh, to have that on, and it would be part of the team that would we be, be building out, but um, that would be uh, bringing in some different uh, areas of expertise. Obviously, this would be focused on 
energy and the private sector and having somebody come from the private sector uh, to work with energy companies. And the other proposal we're talking about also having corporate relations and business development, but that would be broader than just energy. Good, thank you. Other questions? All right, thank you for that clarification. Letter 14. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, letter number 14, uh, school capital construction account, true up statistics and additional requests. Mr. Chairman, uh, the governor's requesting your consideration uh, to cover the unanticipated costs to major maintenance and capital construction projects. <clears throat> Excuse me. The state construction department has calculated a net increase of approximately $300,000 for major maintenance based on the latest figures from the Wyoming Department of Education. And those are the, un, un, the unanticipated costs for capital construction are as follows. <clears throat> $1,800,000 for the 10 sleep project, $492,000 for the Riverton Auditorium and 459,141 additional for the component project requests. And Mr. Chairman, we offer this recommendation for consideration of the, of the committee. Okay. Questions? All right. All right. Thank, thank you. you. <clears throat> uh, just, to, just out of curiosity, on the three hundred thousand, I mean, I mean that's almost a, a, a rounding error. I mean, when you look at the total amount of money, I'm just is, is there anything particular around the is it just running, that's just the additional money when you run through the formula on, on just advice, is that what that is? And just rounding This is your last chance to increase. <laughs> Mr. Chairman, Erica Ligurski, Senior Policy Advisor, Governor Gordon. Yes, when I talked to, um, you're exactly right, when I had talked to Laura Anderson at the um, State Construction Department, it was based on some conversations that you had had with that division about the calculation. And so they had just reran that calculation from the previous figures that they had given for the um, major maintenance. Okay, thank you. Letter 15. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. <clears throat> Letter number 15, grant writing. Mr. Chairman, from, uh, from the state to local government level, uh, if, if Wyoming has been un clearly understaffed when it comes to applying for and securing grants from the federal government or private entities. Given the opportunities to make some one-time investments now that could yield benefits in future years, the governor is proposing that we invest in grant writing capacity for the state and to support local governments. At this time, we can't tell you if it would be more successful to hire uh, capable individuals or award a contract to a private business with experience in this area or some combination. Therefore, the governor is requesting that you give some latitude to our office to either um, use the 100 series money for temporary positions or use 900 series funds for contracts. And it is the governor's belief that in particular, uh, this is key to having a shared resource for uh, cities, towns, and counties and other local governmental entities to get support on applying for grants. And therefore, the, the governor is proposing $600,000 of one-time funds from the general fund to our office uh, for the purpose of adding temporary staff or contractors to serve local entities and state agencies. We believe firmly that we should track how many grants this funding brings in and, and use it to determine if this should be an ongoing investment. Thank so, you, Mr. Chairman. Chairman. Go ahead, Mr. Vice President. So, so a question on this, it doesn't specify whether these would be federal grants, foundation grants, state grants, there's a, a whole number of different potential entities that you could do grant writing for. And then is there a particular area of, of focus? Is it different infrastructure grants or is it cultural resource grants or natural resource? And the reason I ask that question because typically those take more specialized grant writers and somebody that's writing an education grant is probably not going to fare too well putting in for a federal natural resource grant for say to the RCPP program that may be for 10 or 20 million dollars they lack the skills to do both because they're technically aspects so 
Is there a focus on these grants or are they specifically for federal? And is there a certain within the local government spectrum um, direction for that type of grant writing expertise? Mr. Chairman, is that Who's gonna answer that one? Sure, and again, there is some overlap. There's a Drive Thrive proposal for grant writing at the Energy Authority. Again, that's specific to federal grants related to the energy industry. Um, this, this is developing, I think, in, in all of our minds, but because what we know is, is that especially the smaller communities just don't have the resources to do this. So um, if we could find someone um, who'd be particularly well suited to come in and help and be here, um, and, and, you know, be a, probably an AWAC is what I would consider it to be. Um, and, and you just have to take the best person to, to see which experience they do have. Um, the other opportunity is, is to work with a, a, a company that does have experience across all of those grant types. I'm thinking federal and private, um, because you're right. You, you, we could also help and hire someone who would just help local communities apply for other state grants, um, you know, get good feedback in the MRG program and how easy that is to apply for. But I don't think we've hit that, especially when there's a nexus to the feds. The SRF fund is, is a complicated program to apply for, for a local community, especially a small one. So I, I think this, we're asking this to be nimble um, because I think we could probably hire a lot of people to help out uh, in all of those facets. So we're just, we're going to have to prioritize and, um, that is definitely something we'll be interested in having a conversation with if you all are interested in this concept. Well, Mr. Chairman, just to follow up, there, three years ago, we funded a position in the Office of State Lands and Investment to help some of these smaller local communities navigate some of this grant writing process, particularly whether they're SLIB, MRG, SRF, clean water, water development, uh, rural utility system. You know, so it's a combination of federal state. So is this to complement that position or is it to add another position, but put this position apparently in the governor's office? So would we then have two positions, one in, in the Office of State Lands and Investment, one in the governor's office that would be helping these local governments? And, and again, is it, would this one be more specific to federal grants or would it be more duplicative to the Assistant, additional assistance in the Office of State Lands and Investment. Mr. Chairman, uh, great question. That's an engineer position that's at OSLM was created. Um, the, the governor asked you for it in the 2019 session. And that position is more focused on helping in the process, not necessarily doing applications for locals. So it certainly wouldn't be duplicative if, if you wanted to hire somebody and bring them in to help locals do applications uh, because that, that support for, for state grants like that isn't happening right now, I'd say. Um, there are great people in the Office of State Lands who do help and the MRG program is an example of a good application process we have down. Um, but it's even hard to find a good engineering firm for a small community to help do the planning for a good SRF application. So th there's, there's room to grow in that space. This proposal, though, is more focused on federal applications. I, I think we would, I would be hoping that we would be bringing in federal dollars that could help our communities um, hopefully offset some, some spending and bring in some other needs, but also to help them meet their needs. We, I think we all were very disappointed when we were turned down as a state on an economic development administration grant for coal communities. Um, but we also had small communities that put in an application there and they were also turned down. So this, this I would be aiming at federal money as a first step. Uh, I don't think this is enough money to do uh, all of the above. So I, the way this is proposed and the governor's thinking about it is, is to support the state and locals to do applications for federal money primarily. And Mr. Chairman, just to follow up, so federal monies, again, there's all kinds of federal money. So is it specific for infrastructure? You know, that typically these grants don't pay just for personnel and stuff. And, and again, versus a, a small local government with, you know, say let's use the uh, uh, RUS program, rural utility systems for USDA, is that 
that the kind of focus versus something that may be um, recreation oriented that would go after land and water conservation type funding programs through the federal government or again natural resource there's a multitude of those in the natural resource field so is, is there a specific emphasis that uh, you're thinking of on this position mr chairman I, I would certainly think the major emphasis right now would be related to the infrastructure bill and arpa because both of them have created so many programs that we'll be running over the next few years but uh, again i i think we could you know, we could all pick our favorite three and we'd still be understaffed. Mr. Chairman. Go ahead, Senator Kinski. Have, have you thought, at least insofar as local government's concerned, have you thought about a, a, just a grant grant out of SLIB for these smaller communities? You, you know, it's, it's, it, it's easier for them to go out and hunt up the grant writer for their specific purpose than to expect one be all do all in Cheyenne. And the line outside that person's door could be quite long. If you if you just gave them the five or ten thousand dollars, it would write the, to write the grant. They could find their own grant writer more readily, I would think. Than uh, you know, and I agree with Senator Hicks. Every time we had to write a grant to the city of Sheridan, we went out and found that kind of grant writer in that space. We just didn't get money from the state to do it. But. Go ahead, Mr. Chairman. You know, the Sheridans, the Cheyennes, the Caspers are all fine. Um, you know, you, you talk to Sundance, you talk to Lovell, they, they don't, they don't even know that the grants exist. So I would see this position working with the budget department because they do work to help um, be aware of what grants and programs are, are available right now. And then, you know, as a first step to just make sure that communities know about them and, you know, they may not have the expertise to go do it, but we could definitely put some, some money aside that if there was a grant that needed some sort of expertise that this wasn't getting to help them on, that they could use, could use some of this money. It would only go to locals as grants for them to actually pay for somebody to do it. But, you know, what I keep hearing from local communities, the smaller ones, is, is that, you know, they don't even know about them, let, them know, let alone have the first idea about how to apply and then to even have any sort of um, strategy around which ones we should apply for. And, you know, I, I agree with you 100%. If we hire three people, the lineup to get them to write grants is going to be enormous, but we're going to have to figure out how to prioritize that. But if we don't do anything, I, I think we're just still in the same place. And that's it. That is we're we're disadvantaged in applying for grants. And again, I think this is an easy one. We've talked about ROI in this room. Um, if you want to measure ROI, this is a way to do it. It's just to say, if we put this in, how much do we get back in money from outside the state? Follow on, Mr. Chairman. Go ahead. I, I know about the, the ROI and I agree with that. I just, what, do we do it in Cheyenne or do we do it in the communities? People have a way of finding out where the money is. They may not have the money to get the money, but they know where it is. KC population 240, they managed to write a grant to get some money for their water system. Sundance, they put up a whole new water tank with, with grant money that they wrote. It, it, they don't necessarily can't spare the bucks to do it, but you know their engineers know where to go get this money. Usually, people can figure out where the money is. But if you really want to help the small communities, give them the grant money directly, rather than make them stand in line with the new hire in Cheyenne. That's just my take on it. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Chairman, I think those are good points. The Sundance program, though, Homeland Security absolutely helped them apply for that. Um, but you know, KC. We dealt with this this summer when the, the line broke down um, up in your district, you know, the state was there to support them. So there are some programs the state's good at supporting right now. But, it, you know, if you think that the grant to locals and just getting it out and not have touching it, I, I don't know that the governor is going to have a huge problem with that. It's just let's get more capacity. Okay, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Mr. I'll, I'll just I would throw in, I just remember, uh, I'm serving on the Efficiency Commission that this was one of the recommendations, having a grant office in the governor's office, one of the recommendations of the Efficiency Commission. The, uh, and what, what the consultants found as, as they did that work was Wyoming, Wyoming was a woefully underrepresented in grant awards, both at the, both at the state and, uh, and also at the community, local community level. Just when you and it, it, with the comparator states that we had, it, was, it was just was, wasn't even close, even when you break it down to our size. The other function, the other function that you have, and, and, and I don't disagree that, that having money available to grant, however it's done, however it's done, 
um, is the right way to go. But the other, the other, one of the other concerns that that this that this committee's had before, and was also part of the recommendation, was that the grant to make sure the grants were consistent with the policies that we've got in force. We 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 all know that there are schools, there are state agencies that have applied for grants that are inconsistent with what the whole purpose was. We've had state agencies in the past that have applied for grants that started new programs that then ran away and then all of a sudden were left to fill that, fill that void with general fund money. So part of the other, the other portion of the grant office was also to do some monitoring of grants to make sure that you're not, you're not going after money that leads you down a rabbit hole that's going to end up costing the state more money or leaves us in a direction we don't want to go. Um, we all know that we can all find, everybody can think in here of an anecdote where there's been grant money that you, you were just aghast that they even asked for it and that it was awarded for that purpose. It's not hard to find that both at the state level, local level, and the federal level. So that's just, that's just all part of that. But going back again, I mean, it's so is, so I, you, there's a 650 in the drive and thrive proposal, then there's this 600, but they're not the same. Just want to clarify. Absolutely different. That again, the energy authority one would be strictly for energy energy related grants, um, and we we assume those are going to be very complex. All right. Thank you. Any other questions or comments on fifteen, sixteen? Mr. Chairman, thank you very much. Uh, letters sixteen and seventeen are, are both related to the uh, ARPA revenue assistance and and. Uh, uh, and the proposals on how to move move that ahead. So with that, I, I think I'll turn that over to uh, Policy Director Rennie McKay. Okay, hey, Rennie. Mr. Chairman, hopefully th these are quick for you. Letter 16 is um, an update. We got new guidance from the U.S. Treasury yes, uh, last week. And so uh, that within that, there was a change on the calculations uh, for revenue loss. And so this uh, letter updates that. Um, and, and looks at our plan on how to convert that, including uh, the con uh, um, or, or, or how we can use that revenue replacement funds uh, for eligible projects and FMR um, by using um, the ARPA dollars for highway construction, which is an eligible use um, that would free up the ability to have FMRs go into the general fund. So that's that's the, that letter in a nutshell, but I, I turn it over to Director Hibbard to see if he has anything to add. Thank you, Kevin. Mr. Chairman, uh, this week we discussed uh, revigorating the research on permissible uses of ARPA, particularly in the conversion of ARPA Direct to ARPA Revenue Assistance. And there's directors in this office that have been receiving emails from the state budget department to get to us those permissible uses. That would be the best way to do it, to find it in the standard budget we can and, and, and leverage that. This letter is a contingency plan to ensure that we can convert the total amount that's available in revenue assistance by positioning us to use YDOT's FMRs because they do qualify for roads for the conversion. But naturally we'd like to use the standard budget so we can find them under permissible first. So we'll continue to work on that and provide that information to LSO. These would be the under, under the cap FMR, is that right? Mr. Chairman, that's correct. Okay, thanks. All right, thank you. Questions, all right. Letter 17. Mr. Chairman. It's the I, thickest one of all of them. <laughs> Mr. Chairman, with the updated guidance that came out last week, Essentially, they did rulemaking on, on ARPA, whereas with CARES, they just issued guidance and then would update it in their FAQ periodically. They did rulemaking this year for ARPA. Um, this does, um, the new guidance and rule does not go into effect until April 1st. The U.S. Treasury is saying that uh, states, locals, uh, and tribes all should follow um, that the published draft final rule until April 1st and consider it the new rule. Um, definitely changed some things related to broadband and water and sewer um, and a few other things, again, including the revenue replacement. Um, one of the other things is for capital construction, there is, they do now require written justification for projects over $1 million. Um, so in this letter, uh, Mr. Chairman, again, just want to point out two switches as we've analyzed 
um, the ARPA proposals for and, and worked with uh, Clifton Larson Allen, our, our consultant on this. Um, so asking to, in the, in the proposal to all of you, the destination defining development that was under ARPA, ARPA Direct uh, for $10 million, uh, we're proposing to switch that over to the revenue replacement general fund section of the proposal and trading that off with outdoor recreation infrastructure because uh, in, the, in the analysis, we think there'd be about $10 million that would be eligible for ARPA direct. Um, so uh, no change in the overall ask, just a, a change in the funding source. Um, and that's reflected in that table that is attached to make the letter a, a, a few more pages. Uh, also highlighted in that letter, uh, Mr. Chairman, is the changes related to hospital and healthcare infrastructure. So just wanted to make sure that was flagged for all of you about what that new guidance says on that front. And so then this, this ta the table on the back of letter six of letter 17 replaces the, the uh, one we got on the 16th of December in the drive and thrive proposal. Yes, Mr. Chairman. Go ahead, Representative Larson. Rennie, uh, the, the guidance that you had here on eligible projects for capital expenditures, is this more restrictive or more expansive than what you had previously thought? Mr. Chairman, that, that's a great question. Uh, um, the other part of that, that what we've learned is, is having CLA on board really helps us. So this would definitely provided us more clarity. I, I would say, uh, um, I, I, would, I would have been nervous about how vague it was before. So by listing out emergency rooms, ICU facilities, that helps. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Chairman. Representative Stiff. Yeah, Rennie, um, the letter deals with a destination defining development program to move that to uh, conserved funds, I guess. Uh, the question is, can you explain just what that program is? I don't... I read the description here. I just don't have a good grasp of what it means. Mr. Chairman, the, that program is designed and uh, proposed to put out funding to work with communities so that they would have the ability to, um, and, and you definitely need some matching funds on this. They had proposed, I think, $80 million uh, would how they viewed it in their conversations with local uh, communities. So this is really essentially just a pilot at this phase to try to help do some community development projects that would be what you would market in terms of um, that community. So uh, just to throw it out there, David Street Station is an example that people have held up that the creation of David Street Station has helped uh, the Visit Casper um, organization promote um, downtown Casper better and give visitors something more concrete to come visit. So it's kind of anchor um, community facilities that are uh, what bring in tourists and enhance their stay in the state. Okay, any other questions? All right, does that conclude the governor's letters? So you have the governor's office. Is there any other questions you want to ask the governor's office while they're here? So we have them. You don't always have them in front of you. If there's any other questions you want to ask about Anything that you want to clear up on the on the budget or anything else, you got them. You got them here. All right, we know where you live. If we have more questions, come find you, Mr. Chairman. I was going to ask to stay for a little while to talk to you about ARPA questions. Give you a, a, sh a short rundown sure. on the um, public comments we've received. And sure, let's do that. That's all right with you. Yep, <laughs> uh, I know where you live, and I'm staying on your couch. <laughs> So, Mr. Chairman, uh, we turned off the public comment um, on the ARPA proposals this morning, and so I've provided to uh, your staff uh, all of the comments that came in through that online form, and also a few of the specific written out proposals that had come in, so you all have access to that. Um, you know, definitely a lot of engagement from those folks who are interested from the, the tourism sector and the communities, lots of uh, municipalities. Um, we're commenting um, from around the, the state. So um, I can go through each goal with you, um, but just be highlighting generally that, that you have all of those comments and um, some of the comments are extensive and some of them are, are just, uh, we ask people to give us 
kind of their temperature on what they think. So got good feedback, um, appreciated that, but, but we know that um, you know, the people who were, who were going on there were either generally excited <laughs> about the proposals or uh, generally concerned. Um, so you know, certainly we were hearing a lot of, um, on the first goal, um, which is about the livable communities and, and, and attracting and retaining families, um, you know, that how important childcare is um, and how important workforce is, but certainly the housing proposal there was supported in a big way. For economic development, um, air service enhancement is certainly an area that um, we heard about from the southwest corner of the state, um, that, that that was very important, especially in Sweetwater County. Um, and then I uh, got some feedback and provided to you all a specific proposal um, related to climate action and um, a proposal um, for, from a nonprofit up there that would help out municipalities interested in trying to take on um, climate issues. Um, for workforce and education, again, I definitely heard about childcare um, and some specific ideas about apprenticeship programs um, and a good proposal from um, Climb Wyoming that's working with DFS and workforce services. Um, so provided that proposal to you all as well. Um, broadband, uh, support for, for broadband from uh, folks who commented and about how important it is for telehealth too. Um, for health and human services, uh, definitely the, the idea of, of building and enhancing some hospitals around the state was something that uh, we heard from, especially uh, the sublet and Fremont. Um, uh, did get one comment about bringing a medical school to, to Wyoming. Um, and um, a nurse navigation proposal too that's in the, the comments for you that's more extensive. I'd highlight that one. Um, for outdoor rec and wildlife, um, that one had brought in the most comments and the, the most interest. Um, and, and definitely there was comment that we need to, if we're doing outdoor recreation and supporting any of that, you have to balance the impacts on wildlife and open spaces. Um, so definitely heard about that and heard about some local programs that people were really interested in. Um, food insecurity, there was concern about the cost on that proposal that came in and also a uh, comment about how important that those programs are to deal with food insecurity and, and the, the food bank. Um, system. For infrastructure, um, some folks from Teton County would like a tunnel. So I, did, I don't know if that was you, you Senator. Um, <laughs> is, is that, is that, that's going to be under, underneath the uh, under, underneath Teton Pass from, from the tunnel from, uh, from what would that be? What's that little Triggs? <laughs> That's exactly it. What one person did say, what about just the avalanche sheds? Uh, so, uh, but definitely, I think you all know that in Teton County, how important that issue is for all of you to have that pass open. Um, on the efficiency goal, we heard an idea about opening satellite offices in Laramie to attract UW um, alum who will want to live over there. Um, and then did hear about needing help with grant applications. Um, for local communities, definitely was, we're hearing about the need for local infrastructure, water and sewer and, and roads. Um, and so the, um, that was, that's kind of a quick summary for you, uh, Mr. Chairman, of the public comment we got in, but we, we got hundreds of comments that people took the time to go do that. So I, I appreciate that you're willing to, to also receive the written version of that. And, and uh, so uh, appreciate that a lot. And, and uh, that really sums it up for you. So after that, if you have, I know I got some specific questions about ARPA and the proposals that the governor provided to you all, and I could go into that section. So yeah, Mr. Yeah. Co-Chair, my suggestion yeah. is that if, if you have specific questions, we ought to ask them now, but I think we really need to read all these and then we're not gonna really get into um, the ARPA bill until Thursday. So we'll have Apple opportunity after we digest all this to put more questions to me for you. Um, unless, you know, unless you've got a no, list to I, work from. I, I don't have a list to work from. I think this will be helpful. I think this will help us flesh out some of the, some of the things that we, we forgot since December 5th, 16th, I think was when you, or 17th, whenever you did that. And so we'll do that. I think that's gonna be really helpful. It's just, uh, and then of course, I mean, the table as, you know, is just a summary, summary summary of a summary. So we appreciate that. And uh, we'll spend some time looking at those. Does, does anybody else have any questions or want to do it differently? Mr. Chairman, I... We got, so let's go to Senator Drew and then we'll go to Senator Q. 
Kinski, and then we'll go over to you, Representative Walter. Just a procedural, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Just a kind of procedural question. This, the consultants that you have, are they, would there be an opportunity for us to talk to them? At least get, you know, and get to try to get an understanding of what they're, of how they're approaching this and-, and Or submit some of our proposals to them. Mr. Chairman? Well, yeah. maybe so. Yeah. Mr. Chairman? Yes, go ahead, Kim. I'd had a, a brief conversation with uh, Don here just recently about how we can engage that process in specificity. We want that to happen in particular, as we go through the session, there's bills proposed and all those things, we have to continue to test all this stuff. So that's a welcome idea. And that was the expectation from the beginning. Go ahead, follow up. Follow up. Yeah, that, and that's kind of what I was looking for as far as, this is gonna be obviously a very fluid deal and we're gonna get new input and we're gonna, and so I was just wondering, it might be helpful for the committee. I think it might be helpful for me just to understand their baseline and how they're dealing with this to start. And then as it evolves, because we're gonna get, a, as it goes back to what we say a lot right here, we're gonna get questions from the floor about this stuff. So the more we know about how it came to be, the easier it's gonna be for us to try to explain what we do agree on. Mr. Chairman, uh, Director McKay and I have had conversations with the consultant and we're trying to choose the, the right time to have the introduction. You know, they're busy right now getting on the feet. Uh, they are conducting those requests that we have, for example, the courts, they're just about finished with the request that you had for us to review the courts. But we're looking for the opportune time for us to actually have them either uh, join us here or do it through teleconference to have an introduction uh, to CLA and have you the ability to uh, ask them questions to navigate and also express what your needs are like you're doing right now, because we want to fulfill those needs. And, and that's what the contract was for. Uh, Absolutely. So uh, we can collaborate on what that opportune time is, and we'll get that introduction started for you. Okay. Anything else? Senator Kinski. Mr. Chairman, Ed, since you held up these, these additional exhibits, I wanted to mention also, uh, Don sent me the governor's B11 on the initial $27 million of ARPA funds, which went to WIF, and I found that, uh, I found that very instructive, and, I, and it helped me understand better what what they have in mind for WIP two and three. So if, if you haven't seen that B11 letter, Don can certainly send it to you. you, you can you just put it on the, in, in the SharePoint, Don? Uh, Mr. Chairman, it, it is there, but we'll make it more prominent. Where, which, which? It's in the B11 the, directory on the left-hand the... side, yes. All right, thank you. Why don't you move that over? Why don't you move, move a copy into the executive letters directory and. We'll find it there. We can find it with the executive letters. As you can see, we get a few pieces of paper during this process. Representative Walters. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, with a little latitude, I have a question on the BRC gap funding request. And maybe someone with the business council would be able to answer this. We were given a summary of the projects that would be needed or that would this funding would be used to help uh, bridge that gap. And my question then is, of these original amounts, was the entire amount listed here, the entire amount of the project, or was it a portion of the project? <clears throat> it's really that it, that's the first part of the question. Mr. Chairman, um, certainly we do have quite a few people in the room who can answer questions. Um, Josh Durrell is, is online. He'll answer your question. We also have Scott Hoversland, who's the executive director of the Wyoming Community Development Authority. If you had questions on the housing authority, he is online. And Luke Reiner is on uh, the director of YDOT, if you had questions on those. But uh, um, if it's all right with you, Mr. Chairman, you got uh, CEO Josh Durrell available on this question. Josh? <clears throat> yeah, thank you, Mr. McCain. Mr. Chairman, uh, I think that's a, that's a great question, Representative Walters. And the answer is those uh, in that particular spreadsheet, you will see the original total project budget column. And that is the entire original project budget for the par portion of the project that we know about and we might track. Uh, so that is the the entirety of those uh, of those projects from our perspective. Okay. 
Mr. Chairman. Go ahead, Senator Kinski. A follow on to, to Representative Wilk's question. And I and appreciate the spreadsheet. It's very helpful that it shows four of the projects, which have some big numbers attached, haven't started. Um, it'd be helpful if you could give us some options, some options on how they can cover that gap. We can make them pay for it, we can pay for it. Are there other grant opportunities for them? In particular, CDBG, I don't, I don't know enough about how that program works to whether to know whether they can go back to the well, uh, to the feds instead of us covering that gap. Give me some idea on what some options are besides us writing a check. Uh, Mr. Chairman, if I could answer that. Sure, uh, go ahead, Josh. Um, Senator Kensky, that is a part of that is part of what we're doing. And uh, I think a couple of things are are notable here when it comes to what are their options moving forward. So in a number of these projects, I believe three of these projects that are that are water related and water is an element of, of economic development and something that we do help with for infrastructure quite a bit. Um, many of those projects, we are working with SLIB to determine if those projects can um, you know, receive help from that any of their programs. Um, I do believe that uh, we are, and, and we are asking these, uh, these grantees to go back and look at how they might be able to accomplish this in other ways. Um, as as uh, we did discuss a little bit uh, the other day in our testimony during our own budget, we talked about the fact that there are two of these projects that do have a loan component. One of those projects has already gone back and, um, and requested a, a, a bigger loan and been approved for that again. So that money will come back to the state. Um, so the other part of this is, um, and again, you know, we're going to likely have to overturn a lot of stones, or sh I should say, these projects are going to have to overturn a lot of stones. Um, you can see the cost rising. I do want to address a, a question that came up before, and that has to do with the, the you know, project management and how these projects are going. Um, what we have seen and, and what we have uh, recognized is that these projects are, uh, they're, they're done really well. Um, there's a lot of oversight. You can see that in many cases, we are but one of the funding mechanisms for the project. And so, uh, for, for example, in the airport project, that, that is a nearly, nearly $19 million project, and, and we are a component of it. So there's a lot of oversight on these. Um, and, and, and so the, the, from the federal government, from our own, from, from their own, uh, their boards, so there's a lot of oversight here, and I just want to make sure that whatever whatever avenue we take to fund these, that there will be a rigorous process to apply for and to ensure that what they're asking for comports with the rules of the program that they're utilizing. So I think that's a key component as well. Now, in terms of the options, I, I think we can tell you the options that we have. For example, we could utilize those as just general funds that our board approves. We could have these monies put into the BRC account and go through again, the board and SLIB approval on those. I think there are some multiple ways that we can do that. Um, and, and of course, I, I know just the, the tenor of our board and, and um, the SLIB, SLIB uh, briefings that I've been through that we always ask for and we will continue to ask for other funding mechanisms that are being utilized so that we are not the only funding mechanism. And I think you can see that in most of these cases, that is true, that, that we are just one of those mechanisms to fund these. Ho hopefully that answers your question, sir. Thank you. Representative Walters, you have anything else? Thank you. Representative Larson? Uh, Mr. Chairman, yeah, why, why we've got some of these agency heads here. I'd really appreciate uh, Director Johansson, perhaps Director Smith, Schmidt helping us. We've mulled around this innovation, health and human service innovation fund. If you could help us understand that is, and then maybe Stefan, if you could also, or Director Johansson, if you could give us kind of an overview of, of the EMS issue. There's a couple there, the stabilizing fund and region. And, and our questions on the house side has been, is this a regional concern, the EMS deal? Is it statewide if you can, I mean, we don't, just kind of give us a, a feel of what the concern is. 
on corn innovation fund. Mr. Chairman, uh, Representative Larson, uh, Stefan Johansson with the Health Department. The innovation fund, similar to the CapCon Health CapCon proposal, was really a collapsing of a lot of feedback we heard from the engagement process uh, with the public, with providers, with communities, um, and builds off a statutory structure that the legislature put into place a couple of years ago through Senate File 150, which established a health innovation fund. It was mostly specific to long-term care and digital medical innovation, uh, ultimately in the round of budget cuts that we absorbed a couple of, uh, of years ago, we defunded that program. This would build off of that statutory structure and expand it to some additional categories, uh, including uh, one that I think is very important to the Department of Health, which is mental health and substance abuse. Uh, as you all know, uh, or, or might know, we have a large mental health and substance abuse reform effort that um, I'm optimistic we can complete and implement within the next two years. Um, these funds would allow providers who are part of that to uh, have some investment in things that we think will be necessary in that reform effort, like updating um, their eligibility capabilities, uh, their ability to procure higher level providers, um, and, and potentially some other categories as well. Uh, in addition, in the innovation fund uh, proposal, uh, we do have long-term care as part of that, similar to what's articulated in Senate File 150 from a couple of years ago. Um, and a category that I'll defer to Director Schmidt on human service uh, innovation, which relates to recent uh, congre congressional legislation in the Families First Act, as well as I think a general state uh, preference um, for transitioning providers to best practices. So I'll kick it to Director Schmidt uh, to give you a sense of those. And then happy to talk about what we envision the structure of the innovation fund to look like, the application process, et cetera. Mr. Chairman, Representative Larson, about the questions around the Human Services Innovation Fund. As we've been working in just throughout my career, there's always this conversation about best practices and converting all of our, our services to best practices or implementing things that we know that work. But very seldom do we have an opportunity for funding to help our providers do just that. So part of the Innovation Fund thinking also was as a result of uh, feedback received from stakeholders that said we would appreciate the opportunity to be able to review the services we provide and look at how we can make them more evidence-based practice based. Um, the the tie-in though to the uh, legislation that the director mentioned was really comes around families first and families first allows us to use uh, 4e money title 4e money which is right now for children in placement. What the Prevention Act let us do is if we have approved programs that are evidence-based, we can draw down 4E money to provide those services. So it's been a change in how child welfare looks at its services, but we don't have any money right now that would be able to provide to providers to be able to, to look at their programming look at their business operations and make that switch. So that's just one example of where we would see human services dollars being available. Um, the grant, it would be a grant-based program, just as Stefan mentioned, it is so that we can compare apples to apples. As we received feedback from all of the stakeholders, they were all over the board. And so as you're reviewing all of these proposals, how do you make a determination about which one is better perhaps than the other. So the grant proposal, the grant application process will allow us to establish the eligibility requirements that are one already in ARPA and then two can reflect the conversations that you've been having and we've been having since, um, since the strike team was actually created. So it is a repository type thinking, a grant type thinking, but um, you know we were receiving grants for or proposals for $50,000 and then $500,000. How do you compare those two? And Mr. Chairman, I might uh, just close to give you a sense of some of the other categories that were within this proposal. Um, there's $20 million proposed and recommended uh, in, in this area, uh, two of which we, we detailed, uh, Director Schmidt and I just now with human service provider innovation and community mental health reform. 
Um, there's also a category for rural health innovation. You may have heard from the university, I believe earlier this week on various proposals they had, one of which they made to the governor's health task force and to the Department of Health for a rural innovation institute, which would uh, try to accomplish a number of things. That category is articulated within this goal as is long-term care uh, and again, digital medical innovation and health information technology. Things like health information exchange expansion, as you know, that project has been underway with the Department of Health and uh, the state for a number of years. Uh, it's, it's gone well, but we still have work to do onboarding providers in that exchange. Uh, funds of this nature could go into one-time investments there and, and create a little bit more sustainability in, in helping providers onboard into that system. Um, as Director Schmidt mentioned, uh, we do have a structure, I think, between our two agencies, at least in some of these proposals, where we could make that work uh, efficiently uh, without too much administration to um, set up the ability to review uh, those proposals that would come in within these categories, score them based on the ARPA guidance, based on the outcomes that they are uh, going to be required to prove. Uh, and then in the other categories, there are other bodies potentially that could act as scorers or reviewers uh, like the good group that's been established on the health task force, for example, um, could be an entity if this body uh, so pleased to fund this that could uh, provide that higher level uh, review uh, to essentially call the herd of those proposals. So Mr. Chairman, Mr. happy to stand for more questions on that. Mr. Chairman. Go ahead, Representative Stiff. For Director Johansson or uh, Ms. Schmidt, on the so on the description for the Health and Human Services Innovation Fund, a $20 million request there on the explanation that we have uh, when it comes to program metrics, how will you track success and proposed outcomes? We have columns and rows and they're all blank. Okay, so it's hard for me to evaluate that, right? I don't even, and on the, on the tracking success, the me, even the metric is to be determined. So, <laughs> You know, I'm just having a hard time making this concrete to evaluate whether it's a good idea or a bad idea. And so is there any way to fill in the blanks? Mr. Chairman, Representative Stith, I completely agree. Um, it's impossible to evaluate these metrics now because we don't have them. Um, the, to give you a sense of what was put into statute with the previous innovation fund long before COVID, um, the legislature articulated that we wanted to save state dollars in long-term care and provide additional connectivity to digital medical innovation services. So our rules that, are, that were developed on Senate File 150 um, flush that out and say any company, entity, business, what have you, that, will, that wants to propose on that or wanted to propose on that must demonstrate a randomized controlled trial or scientific study to implement uh, a project that will, for example, save the state money in long-term care costs. Then the department would have, if we didn't defund it in the budget cuts, would have evaluated the, the entity's proposal on those uh, same lines and determined with a committee approach if it was worth funding, worth taking the risk with those funds to get that outcome. That would need to be done uh, and expand on those five categories that I mentioned within that grant application uh, process to see over the course of the ARPA funding between now and 2026, what's the likelihood of success with those proposals? Uh, Director Schmidt, uh, please add to that. Mr. Chairman, Representative, there's also going to be the opportunity for the proposals themselves to lay out what the return on investment is and also the metrics. So for example, there was a proposal that was submitted a little bit late, I think Director McKay referenced it, and that came from Climb Wyoming. What that proposes to do is to increase the number of clients who are, um, are providing support through employment training over a period of time. And let me give you a concrete example. We have a pilot project right now with the Department of Workforce Services and with the original founders of CLIMB that um, provides additional wraparound uh, workforce services to parents who are unable to pay their child support. So they're non-custodial parents who haven't been regularly paying their child support. They're very difficult to employ. So through this pilot project, we've been providing more services that are a little bit more intentional for their needs. And then what we're seeing is an increase in the number of parents who are paying their support. So that is an example of a, a proposal that could potentially come to the Innovation Fund and then with, through their own presentation, 
laying out what they propose are going to be their outcomes. So it's intentionally kept vague in the presentation and we knew, we knew that was probably gonna prompt some questions. So I'm glad to, that we're able to speak to those, but the, this is a little bit of a different type of thinking. And um, we've talked a lot about risk and we, we are, of course, our government, we're rather risk adverse, but this is an opportunity to use some one-time funds that are federal dollars to allow us in the health and human services world where there usually isn't any risk investment to try some things out. And we talk repeatedly, especially in the mental health world about best practices, we should be doing things better, but we never have the flexibility in our funding to make those transitions. And, and yes, some of these dollars are going to be invested with some risk, um, but we think that this is an amazing oppor opportunity to be able to test some of those theories. How will we, how will you, how you uh, transfer the knowledge if, if, if that's funded and, and this happens? I, how, do, how do you see that transferring that, does that transfer does affect the, the outcome? Do you report, but how, how do we, how do we figure out the successes if you get successes and how do we then in turn on implement those things? We can flip a coin if you'd like, Director. Uh, Mr. Chairman, that's a good question, and my answer will be will, will probably frustrate you. It, it will be a challenge to have fully demonstrable outcomes that are that are rigorous uh, in the time period uh, that's that's available in ARPA for all of these projects that I anticipate would be proposed under this innovation fund. As you know, we in the Department of Health since 2011, 2012, we have a large performance stat uh, initiative where we do value chain and outcomes measurement on every one of the department's programs. And even in that time period of, of 10 years, 11 years, it's still difficult with data lag um, on, and, and having the appropriate data source to measure the outcomes to really say with some of the Department of Health programs, are, do we know if they're successful? We will run into that in an innovation fund like this, depending on uh, the projects that, that come in. Um, but I think building off of the statutory structure that's in the proposal from that Senate file 150 bill, if we require the proposers to, to make sure that part of the proposal is a very rigorous study of the, what problem you're trying to solve, um, that will set us up for more success. But I will say with some of these proposals that we did get and baked them into the innovation fund, in two or three year time frame to really know if it's fully successful will be a, a, a challenge. As you know, in, especially in healthcare, but human services as well, um, it, it's frustrating to me as I know it is to everybody here that the professionals in that arena will say, well, we need 10 years to adequately study that. And uh, frankly, we don't have the opportunity to do that here, um, which does, as Director Schmidt mentioned, create risk um, that at the end of the uh, the ARPA period, uh, there, if this were funded, there likely will be some projects and proposals that might show promise, and the decision would be in front of this body to determine if additional funding uh, from state or other grant source would be, would be necessary or would be desired. So, uh, so but I mean, that kind of gets back to what Representative Stiff was asking. I mean, I get it. I mean, uh, um, you know, it's a little bit of, there's something saying, trust us, and, you know, and then, and, and you know, you, you guys have you guys have a great, have a good track record. I think as far as both performance and, and your administrative skills. So I think you know there's some of that's there. So I guess the question is, how does this not turn into just? I mean, I think what we're looking for is is is, is this going to be? I mean, I don't think you intend it to be, but I mean, is it just going to throw up on the wall and see which of the stuff sticks, and then we'll we'll see what happens there? Or I mean, is there a more strategic? plan where about how you would decide who would get the grants and what areas or what focus, focus foci I guess you would have it's not focuses it's foci well foci you would have on uh, on and at the same time not not going with the predetermined outcome because that's not that's not the point either to just justify whatever your your own predispositions were going into this how, how do we how do you manage that um Mr. Chairman you know that's there's a lot there in that question. And, and so to some extent, on a technical side, the ARPA requirements, the eligibility requirements are gonna help us to kind of hone in on that. There's 
pretty specific category. So that right there is going to somewhat start to filter through. So then what's after that? And that's a lot of the evidence-based practices. What are you doing? And, and I think that is where the key is going to be is in terms of throwing it on the wall. Right, so we're going to throw it on the wall, but the wall's not going to be huge, and you're at least going to have targets on the wall to throw it at. Okay. I, I, Mr. Chairman, I actually could envision kind of a matrix and oh. some spaghetti, and then there we go. <laughs> um, and and honestly, it may be just as scientific. However, I I do think that um, through through experience and through the work that's already being done in the communities, I mean, this is really a community based project. It is going to be, we would expect, um, local providers, local entities to be applying for um, funds to be able to address some of the programmatic issues they've confronted and that are more than likely exacerbated due to, to COVID. So, you know, it's, it's an answer without really an answer, but I, I do think that collectively there's been enough experience with working through and working with our partners that we're going to know a little bit more about how to frame it so that we can get a little bit more specific in terms of what is it we want to achieve. I, I do have to say though, um, so because if, if we're called back in three years and asked, well, how'd it go? I mean, I do expect that there's going to be some that just don't work out. I mean, that is going to be part of it. That, and we, we, we do that all the time. We do that at the federal level, at the state level, when there's grant opportunities, sometimes those projects work and sometimes they don't. And I don't know why that would be any different here. I think what is different though is the opportunity. And we really, I have not had any experience in my career where there's been this kind of um, infusion in, of federal dollars that without a whole lot of um, skin in the game from our end, that we have a great chance to really test something. Mr. Kutcher. Go ahead, Mr. Kutcher. So, you know, originally, the, what the, um, the kind of the guideposts that the executive suggested to us, and actually what we kind of informally have looked at when we're looking at these funds is, we want the biggest bang for the buck for one-time dollars. And we want matching dollars and everything else we can do it so that every dollar goes as far as it can go, um, as opposed to just seeing what sticks to the wall. <laughs> and so, and, and in addition to governor's list, there are um, house and, and Senate lists, and then there are legislative lists and, and our lists. And it's and you know it's when you start with 1.1 billion dollars from what we got from the original presentation with the governor's request and ours, you've already spent it all. Um, it, literally, it's a, it, we could we could use it up and then some. Um, and part of the general thoughts that we've had is we don't want to basically at all and have everything done and come back next year and have nothing. So we're thinking, well, is it 50 50 or what, what it's going to be? But if we do that, the 1.1 goes down to 5. Point, you know, to 5 billion. And then you've got over and, and uh, over and under for different categories. And, and it goes up pretty quickly. I mean, we've got 75 million boom like that for Fire A. And when you add in these various things, frankly, it, it's, it's all gone and then some. So at some point, I think everyone has to realize that number one, we're gonna probably save some of this, not only for um, next year and the next year, but save some of it in the permanent funds because that's a big bang for the buck. And we're going to have other projects different than yours. And so um, it could be that a third of the governor's requests are funded by us and with restrictions on the rest of the money. I mean, and that's just reality. I mean, and that's, that's the nature of this beast. We had this conversation with CARES Act dollars. Um, so at some point between now and, and when we, next Thursday probably, or as, as we put this bill together, I think it would be helpful, particularly for your two agencies to give us a priority. Like if you're getting anything out of this, what would be first? 
and, and then describe why, what's the biggest bang for the buck that we know we're gonna get a real return or the greatest need for who you're serving? Um, because I just think that it would be helpful for us to know that. Mr. Mr. Chairman, it, it, just in terms of philosophy, I think, you know, we've, as we've talked over the last six months, definitely one of the challenges is, is we're trying to figure out what, how do you make the most impactful investment? And for, for the, this program in particular, as, a, as an example, um, we have to spend ARPA, this would be ARPA direct, so they could only spend it on proposals that are eligible for ARPA. So we can't save that part in the permanent trust or put it anywhere else. So, you know, that, that is that area where there's, there aren't strings attached. And what I guess I would just throw out there in terms of the governor's. Um, the governor's proposal is um, just under 300 million of ARPA direct. So there's, you know, the 200 million left. And, you know, it is that challenge of, of having to say no to things um, because the, the request for this innovation fund, I think was 40 million. The governor cut that back to 20. And part of that is a discussion with, with bo both of you. And that is, you know, don't spend it all right now. Um, because I would hope that what we get is an opportunity for them to run a program like this and see what they can bring back to us in a year, even not that we'll say that the recidivism rate of um, teenagers who got early childhood education uh, went down uh, in the next eight months. But what we could see is, is how well was the program des designed? It, you know, are we starting to see things? Are you interested in, in what that was funding and what we're starting to see in terms of metrics and ability to drive that forward for the last, it'll be two years of the ARPA life cycle. So, you know, this, uh, this would offer the opportunity to make some early investments. So you could come back and say, okay, you designed that well, we would like to, and we have to spend it by the end of 2026. We support you doing some more on this specific program, but not that one. That one, you didn't design it well enough, or the application doesn't seem like it's going to meet what we all expect, and that is making a lasting impact. That's I, I, and, my feedback on that. And that we appreciate that. And and I, that's just that's just my co-chairman expressing a little bit. You know, it's uh, just just like your your committee saw, there were there were four billion dollars of, of good ideas. For that billion dollars, and and uh, I, I think I think you'll find that that we're going to get another four billion <laughs> suggestions on that too. So um, we can only spend it once. So, uh, we, but we appreciate your help, and, and we're trying to find the best solutions we can for each of the different uh, types of funds that are available. So, but uh, we appreciate it, and there and there's and there. I'll tell you, there there is a lot of interest in in. Mental health. Mental health is a huge issue, and not just in Wyoming. This in society, the, the amount of young people and uh, young adults and, and teenagers, as well as uh, old people, old people like me. I mean, the mental health. Uh, I don't know if it's because it's worse or just because we started to figure it out. But uh, I don't know how big a problem it is, but it's a real problem. So, anything else for these folks? Yes, we got a, we got a few. We, I think there's a few more. We're not. Done. Stefan's got a long way to go. I think yet still. But. Go ahead, Mr. Co-Chair.
and, and more compliant with the directives of the, of the acts. So. Mr. Chairman, we received written questions from Mr. Richards, I think on Tuesday, right. and that was one of them. 48.6 million is what was put forward out of CARES Act for broadband in Wyoming. Um, but we will answer all those written questions for you and get those to you as soon as we can. Next week, I'd, I expect Tuesday um, with the state holiday, we'd have it all wrapped up for you on Tuesday. What's state holiday? There's a state holiday. <laughs> Um, That's right, I forgot but, about that. <laughs> we, we, we will be working hard on, on getting <laughs> answers to those questions. And if you have any more over the weekend, since you don't take holidays, um, please send those and we'll answer them as quickly as we can. Four weekends. <laughs> exactly. Okay. Okay. Anything, anything else? I, I, think we've, I think we've got, I think we're still working out through your list if you've got a few more minutes, but if these folks all have, it's a Friday and they all have offices and things to do. If, if there's not anything else for anybody else, we can finish up with Stefan and, and, and let these other folks go back to their lives. Don? Did you have something, Don? Uh, Mr. Chairman, just maybe 60 seconds, I believe uh, WDE is um, online and they had a follow-up request from yesterday that they were waiting on, on the maintenance of... Uh, yeah, yeah. Okay, yeah, why don't we, so why don't we, why don't we do that so that we can finish up with. Hey, Trent. Hi, Trent, you're on. Good afternoon, Mr. Chairman. Uh, we do have some information uh, coming your way in response to the questions from yesterday. Uh, we, are, we are working on that. Um, so hope to have that over to you soon. And then we also, of course, have an elected letter that we talked about briefly yesterday for agency 205. Uh, Happy to answer any questions on that if there are any today. Is this the stuff from? Would you? I don't have. Would you ask him to read the question? Uh, Mr. Chairman, I, I think uh, um, he indicated that uh, they would be responding in writing as to the oh. liability uh, or the potential liability of the amount of the waiver that is being requested of the federal government. Is that? That, that's what I heard, I believe. Yeah, Mr. Chairman, we're happy to do that. And then also the uh, follow-up items that we talked about yesterday, there were, there were several questions. We were gonna provide some data, remaining uh, balances and the ESSER funds and cash reserve balances, et cetera. So we are compiling all of that and hope to have it over to you soon. So, um... but that, one of those questions, Don, was the the maintenance of effort. Maintenance of effort and maintenance of equity. Equity. Maintenance of equity. On, on so, those three school and the three school districts. No. Uh, Mr. Chairman, uh, just to refresh the committee's, uh, he spoke to the the three school districts as to the maintenance of equity. I think the question uh, for the committee was related to the maintenance of effort on the ESSER one dollars for which the department will be submitting a waiver at the end of January. And I believe the question, the question um, posed was, what is the potential state's liability on that waiver, both at the K-12 level, as well as the higher ed level? I, I think your interest was, you know, if it's a $20 million um, request for a waiver, you, you might wanna incorporate that into your thinking. If it's a $2 million, yeah. it's a different, different question. That makes sense, Trent? Yeah, that does make sense. And uh, Mr. Chairman, we don't have uh, an exact number just yet. I'm still working with higher ed uh, through, through a few questions there on the appropriation side. Uh, I've been in contact with them this week and they're putting together some information and hope to have it back to me today or early next week. Um, and so once I have that, I'll be able to, to come up with an exact number. Um, so that's kind of where we are right now. Uh, for both FY20 and FY21. Um, so, sorry, I don't have that for you today, but I should have, have something for you soon. Um, again, we're hoping to, to get a, a waiver on that. Um, I know there was also a question on the timing of, you know, when we might expect to, to see a response from US Ed. I believe 12 states have submitted MOE waiver requests, and I don't believe that there has been action on any of the 12 and this is going all the way back to July of last year, 
believe they are all still pending review. So hope that helps. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Trent. Anybody have any other questions for Trent? Thank you. And and Don, as I understand this letter, this is telling us that when you with the updates of the model, and we run the model under the existing law, we're 20 million short. Uh, Mr. Chairman, that's that is correct on the expenditure side, and I'm it is uh, slightly different than what I prepared for you uh, this morning, which is not unusual. It's about two hundred and fifty five thousand dollars different. We do that on purpose. We want both entities to prepare. So we will incorporate uh, this number into the markup of agency two hundred five. The request for expenditures is higher, but keep in mind there's offsetting revenue in approximately the same amount. Thank you. Thank you. Anybody, anything else for Trent? Thank you, Trent. Okay. Anything, is there any, is there anybody, anything else we need to clean up before we go back and go pick up where we left off before lunch? Go ahead. Uh, no, sir, Mr. Chairman, but I just wanted to, um, uh, and you're well aware of the, of the schedule. We have one more agency and that's the courts. Right. Are the courts here? Yes. Yeah, they are. She's, she's back there waiting patiently. Okay. So I think, I think, thank you. I think, except for Stefan, I think the rest of you, we appreciate your time. Mr. Chairman, I'd like to ask Rennie a question. I thought we were going to do Stefan, finish Stefan's work, but if we're not. We are going to finish Stefan. We're going to finish him off. He's finished. Right. <laughs> we got, he's got, he's got a few more, he's got a few more, there's a few more things in our list that we need him to comment on. Would you like to do that before I ask a question of Rennie that's unrelated to? Yeah, ask, ask it because questions. I don't know if Rennie can stay or go after that. But we're just, I'm just trying to let all these folks get back to their lives and not keep anybody sitting around any longer than we have to. Okay, thank you, Mr. Chairman. And ask, uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. My question, Rennie, is on the, uh, the RIS WildLink proposal for $35 million. Is that more? centered around RIS or more centered around WildLink and just a little more uh, detail. I've had a chance to read through some of the program proposal, but I haven't got through all of it yet. So uh, anything you want to highlight would be great. Mr. Chairman, thank you for that question. So the, the, um, as you can see within the proposal, 35 million isn't the total ask for either one of RIS or WildLink. And our, our issue is, is we're trying to work with, with CLA and the AG's office to see how much of either of those would be ARPA eligible. The governor's preference is, is to start with RIS. So that's where that's how he would like to start. If we could spend 35 million on, on RIS, then great. If it turns out we um, of that um, project, we can find that some portion of it is ARPA eligible because of the public safety side of it, then um, we'd fund that. And then the, we are getting indications that WyoLink because radio communications are ARPA eligible. So it'd be ARPA direct. So we, we have that clarity. We don't have clarity on RIS yet, but the governor's preference to all of you is just to start with that and we'll have that analysis from CLA as soon as we can get it to you. So we, had, we, we can decide now and then change Thursday and then change the week after that. <laughs> and, and we got all February. Can, can you do, do <laughs> slashes in bills? Does that work? <laughs> <laughs> the governor's good at marking things out too. <laughs> All right. Anything else? All right. Thanks. Thanks, folks. Appreciate it. Stefan, why don't we go ahead and pick up where you left off and you know, while these folks and you don't have to wait around. Y'all can y'all can take off. Um of course so too. We, we just want <laughs> no, except the courts. So we just wanted to finish up with Stefan. We were we were working that list. I think we left off about where you, you had. I think we left off about on health and human uh, services innovation fund. So I next one on the list was suicide prevention lifeline 988 implementation. Mr. Chairman, members of the committee, I'll, I'll actually try to be relatively brief here, but certainly answer all the all the questions that you you have. Uh, and part of this will be I'll defer to uh, Jen Davis in the governor's office, uh, who's the health and human services policy advisor. Uh, who has uh, been facilitating and leading the governor's health task force where many of these proposals, as I mentioned this morning, originated. They obviously went through the strike team process, were vetted that way, but they originated there. Uh, and, and you would be remiss if you didn't uh, have Jen answer some of these questions of uh, where that information came from. 
Uh, I'll start, Mr. Chairman, if that's okay, because there was a right before we got into uh, the, the ARPA stuff, there was a question about EMS. And there are three EMS proposals that you see in the health area uh, when it comes to the ARPA uh, proposals from the governor. Uh, the committee had asked uh, me, it's an interesting question, what is your vision for EMS in Wyoming? And I'll give you the Reader's Digest version because this is a very uh, big topic. It's a very important topic and one that I think uh, Wyoming and, uh, and several other states, especially rural states, are struggling with. The business model for emergency medical services in a place like Wyoming uh, is, has been and is becoming harder to sustain. Um, that is, won't surprise folks uh, aware of health and human service operation in general, but EMS is uh, a good example because the, the, the costs, the fixed costs are very high. So for a community or a town or a city to have the capacity to respond to emergencies, it's expensive equipment and the ability to respond is kind of the paramount mission. So whether there are calls or not, there's equipment that's depreciating and there's staff that need to be on hand. Whether that's a paid model or a volunteer model, which I'll get into, that, that's the big economic challenge that I think Wyoming faces when uh, many of our communities and our counties and our EMS offices operate on a volunteer basis. And that's just a simple economics and simple funding problem. Secondly, uh, more politically, uh, EMS agencies somewhat dissimilarly from fire or police are not often part of the tax structure locally. Um, so the revenue is not being generated for that emergency service or that part of emergency services like it is uh, in certain other sectors of the local or, or county economy. And third, like I mentioned, um, a lot of Wyoming has historically operated EMS services on a volunteer basis. And that uh, volunteerism that has uh, enabled a lot of this subsidized existence of EMS is, is fading. Uh, in today's world, in today's economy, it's, it's more difficult to keep that going. Uh, we've studied uh, EMS in a variety of ways for this body, for the legislature over the past couple of years with our hospital viability study, most recently and more specifically with our air ambulance waiver study um, that really showed a, a lot of the same thing. There's these, uh, kind of operational and, and economic problems. And then from a Department of Health perspective, we are largely a regulator. We license and monitor quality um, of EMS agencies, ambulances, et cetera, across the state. Um, so the department is relatively neutral when it comes to our enforcement and regulatory um, actions in EMS. But from a public health perspective, uh, from a larger Department of Health perspective, we certainly see the need for the state to look at the sustainability of EMS uh, across all of our communities, which some are struggling more than, more than others, uh, for sure. Um, those studies we're happy to provide you uh, again, uh, but a lot of that work went into um, educating and providing perspective from the Department of Health to the Health Task Force, which ultimately recommended three uh, EMS-related proposals. One being a stabilization fund uh, for $10 million. Uh, and, and I think of that very similarly to how I think of the other stabilization programs that you've heard about today when it comes to provider staffing um, at hospitals and long-term care facilities and other providers, really a cash influx to, uh, on a short-term basis, sustain the EMS operations, allow for upgrading or purchasing of equipment, uh, et cetera. Uh, you also see an EMS, EMS dispatch certification proposal that's a little bit smaller, but would be specifically related to the dispatch function of, of all of the EMS agencies. And finally, a proposal for a EMS regionalization pilot program. A lot of the philosophical and policy discussions that were had at the task force uh, over the course of the past year or two um, really did revolve around debates on how efficiently should you deliver EMS services that was a big topic of our hospital study and our air ambulance waiver study. And they're really difficult conversations to have uh, because when you talk about efficiency, when you talk about regionalization or consolidation, it sounds great. It's wonderful from a, from a pragmatic uh, state and budget perspective, but it often is perceived as how are the winners and the losers going to, going to be created through this effort. Um, and, and that's uh, very difficult. But again, from Department of Health and certainly my uh, personal vision for EMS, it is a sustainability conversation with making sure that our communities can provide this service to their 
uh, to their residents, while at the same time looking at the most efficient way to pay and have or subsidize these high fixed costs so that the operations can continue. And that often creates those difficult conversations about what communities should and should not join together, what entities in a community should or should not join together to provide these services. Uh, with that, if it's okay, I'll, I'll kick it over to Ms. Davis um, and maybe with some of these uh, areas uh, or, or proposals that you see both with EMS, uh, with the suicide prevention, uh, with the health education fund, mental health first aid, food as medicine programs, those were largely uh, health task force, a, a good group of stakeholders making those proposals. And Mr. Chairman, with your permission, I'll, I'll kick it over to Jen Davis for a bit of information there. Absolutely, please. Thank you, Chairman. Um, I will kind of uh, pick up where Stefan left off on the EMS conversation. So as he mentioned, there's the three proposals that were brought forward by <clears throat> excuse me, the health task force. The first, as he mentioned, is the 84,000 for the dispatch certification. What that essentially does is brings our seven remaining dispatch centers across the state um, into a standard that the others have adopted of being able to do emergency medical dispatch. So uh, there is currently a proposed, there is a bill out that looks at doing tele-CPR, this takes it to the next level of being able to do emergency medical dispatch, which includes tele-CPR, but goes to the next level. So as a call comes in, the dispatchers are able to answer that call and provide emergency medical assistance until the medics arrive on scene. So this would bring all of the dispatch centers in Wyoming up to the same standard. So that's what that proposal is about. Um, the second one as, um, Director Johansson had mentioned is around the stabilization, um, which closely ties into that regionalization pilot. So the stabilization, I think there was a question about where is stabilization needed. Um, I'm sorry to interrupt. What, what, what we're curious about is how you came up with the numbers you're asking for. Um, because without, you know, they're all wonderful concepts, but it, 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 we need to understand the dollar amounts. And so did you go out and ask, or did, what, how did that, for each of these, how did you derive the numbers? Uh, Chairman, thank you for the question. Um, the emergency medical dispatch, the 84,000, that was a direct um, response to the dispatch centers across the state, finding out that there was seven remaining that did not have that. And so that is a, a direct number that comes from purchasing the curriculum for those seven entities to come up to that standard. So that was a direct response from the contracting entity that they use. Uh, the 10 million for the stabilization funding, that came about by, um, we have a subcommittee of the governor's task force that is looking specifically at EMS. In that task force, we have the county commissioner association with us. So Jeremiah and Kelly put out a survey for us to all of the counties to see how they are currently funding EMS services, how they are doing at um, the stabilization of those services over the next biennium and what they would need in order to maintain operations as they currently look right now. That 10 million came up from that survey from the counties that responded. The number was larger. We decreased it down so that it did not account for purchasing of new ambulances. Um, it would be for updating some equipment, but not for new purchases, just because then this next conversation in the pilot would be really before we go um, spending more money on new equipment, let's really find out what our need is and how we can have this conversation from more of a collective perspective. So that 10 million was a direct response from the counties um, and the municipalities offering those services. Mr. Chairman. Go ahead, Representative Stephan. Ms. Davis, thank you. And so to use an example, and a Sweetwater County subsidizes the two local ambulance services with about $1.2 million per year. $900,000 a year goes to the Rock Springs Ambulance Service and 300,000 goes to the Green River Service. This 10, the county commissioners of course would love to have some money from you or from the state to, so, to reduce their subsidy. But if this were approved, this $10 million were approved in that, in that hypothetical example, would then the county commissioners in Sweetwater County get say, you know, $300,000 of subsidy, would they get 600,000? Would they get the full 1.2 million each year paid for? And then secondly, is that a good idea? 
okay, right? I mean, they would love it, but this, these are one-time funds. So then we do it for a couple of years and then poof, the money's gone. What happens next? It, which seems like the real problem, right? Because ambulance is kind of a bad business, right? So, so the first part of the question is as a percentage of what the, how the counties currently subsidize it, how much would this 2 million be? Would it be half, would it be 25% or some other number? Chairman, um, Representative Stiff, I think that's a great question. I think the details of that will still be determined um, as we got the survey back. Not even every county responded to that and every municipality offering the services. So I, I would envision that we'll do this um, kind of as uh, Director Johansson had mentioned, um, looking at an equitable distribution like we've done with some of the other stabilization funding. Um, the purpose of this is, is not to fix it. Um, this essentially just helps us get through the next biennium to stabilize the system so that we don't have further um, ambulance services going away in areas. And it would allow them time for us to figure out a sustainability model for funding in the state. We're currently working with the congressional delegation about some things that are happening at the national level for stabil stabilizing this as it's not unique to Wyoming. So I think as we look at a distribution for that, We'll have to do something equitable based on need that each of them are having to just stabilize it in the meantime. There are some areas that are doing fine that are actually making money off of their EMS services. Um, so we would put that all into the equation uh, through a distribution plan. Okay, all right, continue. Um, as far as uh, the uh, pilot program, that was a $10 million allocation. How we came up with that, Funding is, um, as Director Johansson has mentioned, there has been several conversations about regionalizing EMS in order to help stabilize it. This is part of the conversation that I'm having with the congressional delegation, um, looking at the potential from the federal level about doing block grants uh, to rural health systems uh, for EMS and looking at that from a regional perspective. Wyoming currently has five trauma regions so what we looked at was doing a pilot program in each of the five trauma regions. Um, initially, the funding is to bring those groups together for them to have a conversation about what their models look like, how they're currently funding their EMS, how they're staffing their EMS, and is there an opportunity for them to leverage each other in this process. As Director Johansson mentioned, we're seeing a significant downturn in volunteers in this system and looking at moving to a paid programming um, will increase that cost um, as, as you can anticipate. So how do we look at this in an efficient manner in order to help stabilize that? So we um, actually anticipate doing some regional meetings here over the next few months in each of those five trauma areas to start the conversation. The pilot money would be for um, an equal distribution to each of the five trauma regions for them to do the planning um, and an implementation of a pilot in their area to try to decrease the cost of services. The part of the funds could also be used for as um, we don't know what the cost to deliver EMS services with a full-time workforce would be. So part of this pilot program would be really being able to dig in and uh, do a thorough cost evaluation of what does a model like that look like in Wyoming? And then again, how do we sustain it? So as we continue to do this work around EMS, the big conversation is around how do we sustain this for the future so that we don't have uh, more entities that are needing to close their doors and other areas having to pick it up. I got an update from the association today. We have 16 services that are in jeopardy of destabilizing in the next couple of years. Um, and that was as of today. So we have a system that is very fragile and has, is in the midst of collapse in some areas and has collapsed in other areas. And so finding a sustainability model is critical. And as Director Johansson also mentioned, as we look at this from the perspective of um, fire and um, law enforcement, we don't have that same structure as we think about that in emergency medical services, which has been a lot of the discussion um, in the EMS task force. So really the aim is to figure out a sustainability, sustainability model, um, which is going to take time and effort from the legislature as well as from the partners. So this is just one way to 
um, hopefully look at getting these regions to be working together to solve the problem. Okay, questions? All right, continue. Is that, is that cover yours or you got one more? Yes, Representative Schwartz. Not so much a, com a question as a comment. I don't know if you're familiar, but Teton County for years has been having a paid EMT force. So you might look there. I mean, I, I recognize our costs are a little higher than other communities, but we're making it work. Chairman, Representative Schwartz, thank you for that. And um, Teton County was actually one who responded back um, through the association today that um, they are doing a paid workforce uh, where their challenge is, is being able to house those individuals. Um, I know, shocking to you, I'm sure. Uh, and being able to pay livable wages, um, which is also part of the problem, especially when you move from a volunteer workforce to a paid workforce. Everyone's living their van these days. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> okay. Uh, Chairman, that was all I had on EMS. I'm happy to address the um, suicide lifeline and the 988 implementation. Yes, please. So um, the task force put to forward a recommendation also as part of a recommendation through the governor's challenge that we're currently working on for suicide prevention. Um, the request that is um, the governor has moved forward is to bring the Wyoming lifeline to 24 seven operations and to help with the transition to the 988 implementation, which is um, required by the new federal regulation to go into effect July of this year. Um, in order for the 988 system to um, work as projected from the federal government, you're um, supposed to have a 24 seven operation so that when individuals call into that system, they are actually able to connect with Wyoming so that they are able to connect them with the appropriate resources. And so bringing the hotline to 24 seven operation is um, what is in that request, which would be over the biennium for that dollar amount. Um, that again is a, a one-time funding ask in this to get that to 24 seven operations. There is a uh, federal money that uh, we anticipate coming to help with that sustainability over time to remain at the 24 seven operations. Um, as part of the 988 implementation, there's also a component to that about finding crisis stabilization services, mobile crisis teams, which um, will be part of that ongoing process that Department of Health is continuing to look at through their 988 implementation team that is meeting. Any questions on that one? Any questions? All right, thank you. Absolutely. I will continue on down the list if you like that came from the health task force recommendations. The other one pertaining to mental health is the mental health first aid training of trainers program. Um, during the CARES Act funding, uh, the governor gave some money to the Department of Health for this train the trainer program. The intent of this program is to get trainers across the state of Wyoming and mental health first aid. This is an evidence-based program that um, is utilized for suicide prevention for gatekeeper training. This proposal it adds additional funding uh, with the ARPA dollars to bring that um, from the train the trainer model into every county in the state so that there is a trainer there and able to sustain this operation. So with this one-time funding, it will build the capacity of this model across the state so that we have consistency and availability for that, uh, for whoever might be in need of those gatekeeper training services. And thank you. Mr. Mr. Chairman. Go ahead. Representative. Sorry to interrupt, to, to go back to the suicide numbers for a moment or dollar request for a moment. Right now we have a suicide hotline number you can call. It's an 800 number, it's like 273 talk or something. And so right now, if you call during business hours, you get a Wyoming person who answers the phone. And if you call at midnight, they do answer the phone, but it's someone in Florida who talks to you. Is that, and if, but if we spend $7 million, then instead of dialing the 1-800-273-TALK, you can dial 988 and get a Wyoming person 24 seven. Is that the basic, what you get for your $7 million? Or, or is there more to it than that? Chairman? Yeah. 
Um, Representative Stith, uh, you are correct. Right now we have coverage through the Wyoming Lifeline. We have two providers in Wyoming that are providing those services. Um, they do not have 24 hour coverage now. So in the hours that are not covered by one of our Wyoming centers, you go through the national line and then basically someone at the national level connects you um, into Wyoming. So it's not that warm handoff to help the individual and to know the resources at the local level. By moving to funding it at a 24 seven operation, it will always be manned by someone in Wyoming that knows those resources. And again, is a requirement of the new 988 legislation, which is closely tied into the 911 system that we have. So individuals now, instead of calling that 1-800 number, will call the 988 number, be directly connected to the hotline. Should someone still in a mental health crisis call 911 as previous, the 911 dispatch center will be able to connect them directly into the 988 system. So this is really creating our infrastructure between that 911-988 system to have 24-7 operations. Okay, thank you. All right. Yeah. So is there, is there any others that anybody has questions on? Okay, we've, we've had a mental health break request. <laughs> So why don't we, let's go ahead and, and we'll take 10 minutes and come back. I think when we come back, um, I, I, unless other, other people have any questions, I think about the only other question I'm aware of that's been circulating is help us sort, and Corin, this might be you, help us through the various food security. There's three, there are a couple of food security issues, help us understand the differences and how that works. Unless there's other questions, I think that would just about wrap it up for us on this. Is that right? And then we'll be, and then we're ready for judiciary. So we're going to take a ten minute break. Yeah, we're just done. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm sorry. Can I get you something? <laughs> <laughs> Erica.
let's let's finish up and tie a bow on it. So uh, I think we're down. If you if if, if Corin, if you can if you can kind of take us through, I think most of these food security things have have your thumbprint on them, or at least the DFS thumbprint as the administrative administering agencies. If you could take us through those and and uh, just quickly just help us understand why they, why they're not overlaps. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, I, I never introduced myself way back for the record. My name's Corin Schmidt. I'm the director of the Department of Family Services. Um, and I missed the last question that you asked. Just, uh, we, you've got, I think there's three. Mm -hmm. There's food as medicine and food insecurity. There's the, uh, and I think there's another, there's a couple, and most of them are assigned to your uh, food as food medicine, food insecurity. There's a Buddhist medicine project well pilot. And then I think that maybe that's still, and then there's this, which is you're partially on to say is the safety net food network evaluation. Um, and just kind of help us understand what those about and how they're, how they're interrelated if they are. And please. Certainly Mr. Chairman, thank you. And what I'll do is I'll speak to the, the first one, that's the joint effort between the Department of Ag Agriculture and the Department of Family Services. And that's under goal seven, and that's the food um, safety net, basically. And then I'll speak quickly to the request for um, that's based around uh, SNAP eligibility and SNAP um, enrollment. And then I'll let um, the policy advisor speak specifically to the last food is medicine is that's a health task force recommendation. Okay. Um, so the first one is a joint project between the Department of Agriculture and the Department of Family Services. And we have in the Department of Family Services a very small program whereby we provide administrative dollars to Food Bank of the Rockies through CASPER to um, order foods, food product, and then bring it in and then give it to eligible families, senior citizens primarily. So they create, they buy, we order the food, they distribute it. We give them an administrative amount. So that was really um, the amount of interaction we had in the food safety net program outside of SNAP prior to COVID. When COVID hit and we were in, so many people had lost their jobs and they were relying more on donated or pub publicly purchased food. What that shown was a light on the, uh, the fragility of the system and also the lack of dependency on any local providers that basically relying heavily on purchased food or food that um, was canned that came from elsewhere. So, as we had worked on some of the initiatives during COVID with the First Lady's initiative and also other partners, we thought it was a good opportunity for ARPA dollars to be able to really do an analysis of that system. There's, there isn't any one agency that's responsible for that system. It is a, it's a network of providers and uh, the, the food distribution is lo located in Casper for the most part, and then tries to distribute food outward, which could be a really inefficient way of getting food to food pantries. And then also getting um, food to the outer regions of the states on the north, south, east, west corners in comparison to the distribution center in Casper. Um, we also encountered a lot of feedback just through our work with um, the emergency rental assistance program and engaging with community-based organizations that really would like to see some modernizations of the systems. There's no centralized way of really ordering or a good way of ordering from the food bank. Um, the little things such as the pictures don't really depict what's being purchased and so or ordered. And so when it's delivered, it's not necessarily what they wanted or what they thought they were ordering. So the first proposal is really just about asking for money for, to hire a consultant to do that analysis. We don't know what the, the pros and cons of the current system are. We think that an analysis of that would be a better idea. And then from that, come back so, But I mean, ask. when you get down here, you get down the, the, uh, the consultant. So this is the, the safety, net, safety net food network and evaluation is also slash national meeting. 
-hmm. and you've got a two-part project, one hire a consultant to study, and then, but I mean, it's not, I, I can't imagine the consultant's three and a half million dollars. Mr. Chairman, we don't know either. That was a wag that the consultant we, we thought we would budget $500,000 for, and then after that, allocate money for any recommendations. That's what the re remainder okay. is, aside from the Department of Agricultural's request for their national meeting. And that also is a, a timing for the consultant to be able to identify what's going on in the state in terms of food distribution. And at a national level, what types of um, identifying, hopefully, what kinds of regulations get in the way of us being able to deliver food more locally, um, more locally sourced. So okay. it's a meeting they were going to, that, that it's on deck for them to host anyway as part of. Their and then the other, one, the, other one, the other one was, was I think SNAP was, the SNAP was under you. <clears throat> And then that is a health task force recommendation. So what we know is one of the most effective ways in, is to um, for people to have some level of food security is to participate in SNAP. SNAP primarily serves um, elderly, it serves disabled, and it serves working families. Um, participation in SNAP does give a consistent food security. It's not a lot, but it is there. Our penetration rate is extremely low. Of the number of people who would qualify for SNAP, about 35% are enrolled. So we just don't have a lot of participation. Um, we understand that there's, there's a lot of conversation about SNAP and its role in terms of where it fits in our, our economics and our society. But the health task force recognized that as a problem. And because we administer the program, we'll be part of that discussion if it gets funded. OK. All right. Thank you. Sure. And then, uh, and then I think we're going back to you on the, the, I think, the pilot project. Is that? Yes, Chairman. Uh, the final project is the food as medicine pilot for chronic disease, uh, the project well. That is a pilot specifically looking at um, food as a mechanism as for prevention of chronic disease and help and treatment of it. This project would be um, one site location for them to participate in a chronic disease management program. So as individuals are diagnosed with um, the target would be diabetes and um, congestive heart failure is what the proposal is. As those individuals are diagnosed or as they're coming back in for uh, poor management of the disease process, they could enroll into this program, which sends food directly to their home um, at um, a variety of different levels with healthy fruits and vegetables. It offers them then um, assistance in managing their diet. It also gives them um, tele-support for individuals about how the they can um, learn to cook, learn to shop, um, how that works. This would be a pilot project to see if this actually does help us in chronic disease management. Okay, so, so where would it be and how many people would it involve and what would the million, the little, little, just not quite 1.1 million be used for? Uh, Chairman, the program would be here at Cheyenne Regional Medical Center. That amount is for a three-year project. Um, Cheyenne Regional Medical Center um, would take that over after the three-year pilot should they find that to be successful. And if it is successful, it could be replicated around the state and other areas. The um, first year is standing up the program, which there is a fee to enroll with the Project Well program. And then this would be targeting the individuals. Um, I believe in order for the program to um, go as projected, it would have to have at least an enrollment of 350 individuals into the program. So that would be kind of their target for initiating the program. Okay, thank you. Any questions on any of these? All right, thank you, that's very helpful. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Anybody, any questions for the pearls from Dover before they depart? All right, thank you very much. It's a good thing justice is blind.
Yeah. At a roping ceremony. We do have a Lisa Butler, though. Um, she's calling in, so I don't know how that's working. She's phoning it in? Well, I beg there your pardon? Okay. There she is. All right. Hi, Lisa. All right. So, let's, once you, so you, I think you've got, looks like you've got uh, three, four, five, six, six requests. That is correct. All right. Take us through. Mr. Chairman and members of the committee, I'm Claire Smith. I'm the Chief Fiscal Officer for the Wyoming Supreme Court. And online, we have Elisa Butler, our State Court Administrator. So these judicial branch ARPA requests were presented to you during our budget hearing. And our plan today was just to highlight a couple of them that are priorities for us and then um, point out one that we've added. If you would like me to go through all six of them, I can. What would be your preference? I think just Chairman? take us through. So I mean, just take. Just briefly, it's just the circuit court request. One is, is the e-filing request. Okay. Um, let us know, you know, I think you've got the amounts are listed on page one. Just give us quickly, give us the amount and, and uh, how, you, how you're gonna, you know, how you, you know, yeah, what it's gonna do. Okay. Mr. Chairman, I can certainly do it in that format. So our first request is for circuit court e-filing. Um, we have contracted for e-filing in our chancery and district courts, but we haven't done it in circuit courts yet. So um, this funding would allow us to bring those same efficiencies into the circuit courts that we are providing in the district and chancery courts. This amount uh, is made up of an implementation cost of $540,000 and then three, no, four years of maintenance and support. That's how we get to the 2.1 million for that request. So because of the current computer system, you can implement it with this. Yes, Mr. Chairman, that is correct. We have received a quote for this already, and that is the price we've been quoted. And this is just for circuit courts. You already got the, so you've got the, you've got Supreme Court filing system, or is it up? You've got the district mm -hmm. court is your, that's going to launch. You're going to start your pilots this year. Correct. And then, so this, this is, then this is for, this will get the circuit court up for, for uh, electronic filing. Correct. And we already have chance to court up and running too. Yeah, and chance to court. Mr. Chairman, the maintenance and support amount that we have been quoted is $400,000 a year. Naturally, when we do enter into that contract, we would try to negotiate that down. Likes copier. Like copier contract. Okay. okay. All right. All right. Our second request is for um, temporary time limited trainers. And we're asking for this because we've completed the rollout of the new case management system in the circuit courts. And that gives us an opportunity right now to audit and retrain our clerks in proper data entry. We just started the rollout in the district courts of the new um, case management system. And so again, this is a good time for us to be able to provide data entry training and follow up right from the start. We are training the courts on how to use the system, but in order to assure reliable data can be pulled out of the systems, we need to ensure that the data is entered appropriately. And that's a more extensive kind of training than just learning the system. We're not really adequately staffed to provide that to the extent that it is needed. We are doing our best with what we have, but these temporary time limited trainers would give us just some additional training man hours needed to get that adequate training in over the next few years as we wrap up this rollout of the new case management system. And for that amount, um, so that's we've, three, that's three, that's three folks for two years or three years, three, three years, years. three folks for three years. Mm -hmm. All right. Okay. Um, our third request is for courthouse security, and this would provide grants to upgrade inadequate security systems in some of the courthouses throughout the state. Naturally, not all of them would need to take advantage of this, but um, some of you may have just heard that just last week, Sweetwater County Courthouse was on lockdown because of a shooting threat. Unfortunately, nothing came of that, but that just shows that security is certainly needed here in Wyoming. 
So the way that we calculated this amount, we assumed, um, we calculated $75,000 per courthouse. But like I said, not all courthouses would probably need that. Some courthouses may need less, some may need more. So we would have them um, apply for these funds. We would, we would evaluate them based on need and then allocate them accordingly. We also would likely put in a county match as we have done in the past with security grants. Okay. Yeah. Our three to one, right? Three yeah. to one. Yeah. <laughs> that works. Here's the three and here's the one. <laughs> our fourth request um, is for data sharing interfaces. Um, so our case management system collects a lot of data from all of the courts. We currently have a system for data sharing with the Department of Criminal Investigation, and that needs to be upgraded in order to provide a more productive feed between us and them. Vital statistics could also benefit from this project through the creation of a data mart. Currently, they receive data from all of our courthouses, or all of our courts individually. So a data mart would just allow for some efficiencies in that process. This dollar amount, it is purely an estimate on our part. We have not gotten any, we have not uh, researched but based on other projects that we have done in the past, we, we assumed it would be this. Go ahead. Can we go back to the courthouse security? Just, I was just looking at the numbers. So it's 2.175 million, maximum 75 grand per. How many courthouses are there? Mr. Chairman, Representative Schwartz, we have 29 courthouses. That was the number I got. Mm -hmm. Okay. Thank you. Isn't yes. math a wonderful thing? <laughs> Isn't math a wonderful thing? Math is a wonderful thing. <laughs> okay. So anyway, you were you were saying. Okay. Um, so that was our let's see, we're data sharing interfaces. So on the on the data sharing, I mean, one of the things that you know you've got the Department of Health has a has a big system they're putting in. Department of Family Services is working on a big system. One of the things that that is going to be vital is actually, particularly with for juveniles, is to be able to trace trace these folks with unique identifiers so you don't violate any across the system. And so have we had the discussions about this so that this data, this data warehousing and the data, that the data structure of the data that's being stored here will be available so it can be manipulated by the, across, across the platforms where we need to. Uh, courts need to interface with DFS, everybody needs to interface with the Department of Health, all those things. Mr. Chairman, um, if I may, I'm going to allow, I'm going to ask Elisa Butler to respond to that. <laughs> Good. Good afternoon, Mr. Chairman. My name is Elisa Butler. I'm the state court administrator for the Wyoming Supreme Court. We have had conversations, Mr. Chair, with DFS about data sharing within their new system. So it's my understanding that when they implement, when and if, if and when they implement their new system, they scoped in a data interface with the, judi the judicial branch. So we would basically have a data mart of some sort that would feed into the DFS system. We would just need to talk with them once they get to that point and, and discuss what that would look like. So it's my understanding that's, that's the plan. Um, with the Department of Health, I don't believe, and I will tell you just from my experience, I haven't had any conversations with the Department of Health about data sharing at this point doesn't mean that it can't happen. And I think we'd be open to that discussion. All right. Thank you. The, uh, all right. Any other, move on. We're at the answer to request five. Request five is, uh, it relates to our position shortage. And this request would allow us to hire three full-time employees in positions that have been eliminated through budget cuts. Um, our, ex our existing staff is carrying a big workload and we just, we need to get some relief. Um, these positions would be distributed between either the administration office and circuit courts, depending on where the need is the most. Um, we know that going into this, this is, these would be temporary. Um, it, it is just a, it's a short-term fix for a long-term problem. And we know that the question will come, what happens next? And at that, we would have to evaluate where we're at in three years and determine how to move on with these positions. But even if we could just do them temporarily, they would provide a lot of relief for our staff. Okay. okay. 
All right, thank you. Continue. And request number six is the one that we have added. This is for PPE. So as long as there is this public health emergency, we have an obligation to keep our jurors and litigants and staff and judges safe in the court environment. One of our highest responsibilities of the court is to protect those who have been called to jury duty through no action of their own. So this funding would provide for um, cleaning supplies, masks, tests, all those PPE items for another three years as we continue through this pandemic. Hopefully they would not be needed for three years and we will be at a better place. But this, was, um, this amount was calculated based on what we have spent on PPE branch-wide through CARES Act money and then did some estimates on you know, courts, how many, how many trials we'd have, how many people in there, possibly how many tests we might need if that was the route that we went. What was the, what were the amount of qualifying reimbursement expenses you had for your, for these types of things under CARES? Under CARES, um, we spent approximately $125,000. And that was for, from what period of time to what period of time? Um, that would have been from roughly July of 2020 through December of 2021. Okay, so about a year and a half. Yeah. Okay. Yes. So on your uh, personal protective equipment and self tests, or the self tests, the one they spit into and then send off to get looked at, or? Probably, Mr. Chairman, um, Representative Larson. No, we wouldn't do that. We would probably do rapid tests where if they were neat, if we needed to use them within the court environment, we could get results right away. Okay. Thank you. Just curious. Mm -hmm. Okay. All right. All right. And then that brings us to Appendix 1. And there are two requests in there for uh, Equal Justice Wyoming and remote interpretation software. We are working with the governor's office on these two requests. So um, pending that outcome, we may be able to eliminate these two from separate consideration. They may come to you with um, information directly from the governor's office. So we will keep Mr. Richards informed on where we're at on that. Okay. Yes. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Any questions? Any questions? So what happens on a Friday is pretty That's easy. great. <laughs> oh, we do have a question. Um, Mr. Richards. Uh, Mr. Chairman, um, and I apologize for, for interjecting. Based on my read of this, I just want to confirm the language that they use is revenue replacement funds uh, pursuant to the Treasury guidance. We're using conserved general funds because um, the Department of Corrections is largely um, consuming all of the revenue shortfall. So it looks to me like um, your requests one, three, and four are actually going to be general fund requests, and two, five, and six, you believe are eligible for direct ARPA dollars. I could be wrong. I'm I, I'm just um, want to be clear. One, three, and four are revenue replacement or conserved general funds in our lingo, and two, five, and six would qualify as direct ARPA funds. So, and if, 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 you, if you know now, you can do that. If you wanna just see if that, if that confirms later Mr. on, let us know, that's fine too. Mr. Chairman, Mr. Richards, I will confirm that, but I believe that that's right off the top of my head. Um, and some of the analysis that has been done, I'm not sure the name of the company. Um, I think that confirms. CLA, the same Mr. thing, Chairman, CLA, yeah. Is reviewing those now. We should have those answers okay. shortly. Thank you. Anything else? Thanks so much. Appreciate you. Thank appreciate you. your patience and apologize for having you cooling your heels in the back there for a bit. No problem. Thank you. All right. Thank you. Hmm. So, Kevin, I presume that. <clears throat> That we're going to get continuing guidance as the days and weeks go by, similar to CARES Act. And so, and sometimes here in the CARES Act, some of the guidance changed over time, or they said one thing and then modified it. Um, so, 
I mean, I, I think we kind of had to reasonably anticipate that. Was that fair? Mr. Chairman, uh, CLA in the contract, it specifies their assistance through the session with the legislature as well. So do, 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 do we need to have a super duper flex for the governor that allows him that, so, I mean, we'll, we'll correct what we can as we move through, but once we, once the budget sign and goes home and as we continue to figure this out, do we need a, Do we need some kind of super flex that allows him to, to, to move this money, you know, to in the right places as stuff becomes, if we can, if we can, um, uh, you know, use, use the, uh, the converted mr chairman uh, that i mean is that is that what you're anticipating or what do you think mr chairman um that would be helpful but our intent is to get clear understanding and have that for you while it's being worked during the session so you have the answer that's our intent so okay. you have a full understanding of that and that's going to be a, a, a significant lift but that's why we specified in the contract for CLA to make sure that we have that available for us. And we already have conversations uh, engaged with them to make sure we have an understanding of how we work with, with proposed legislation with the Joint Appropriations Committee recommendations. And even uh, yesterday, we started the process to validate judicial branches requests as well. And our intent is to have solid information, but it would be uh, a good contingency plan to have the ability to uh, adapt and change and in both directions i mean correct i mean we've we've saw that in cares where you know we said this the first the initial guide, guidance change later on ended up being more restrictive instead of less restrictive yes mr chairman and that's another portion of the fact uh with our contract is that we have to continue to watch that uh progression of the treasury's guidance my experience like through arpa and our experience with CARES, as you heard from the AG, is get the money spent. Now, well, we need to do these audits. So uh, ARPA is going to be a, a, a more significant lift than that, what, what we experienced with CARES. And that was obvious to us. And that's why we engaged RFP and then we have a contract uh, for our assistance. And if you would like, uh, it's up to the chairs. What's an opportune time for us to introduce you with Clifton Larson Allen? And then you guys, you know, so we can uh, develop a collaborative process to, you know, check the boxes to see that we are getting where we want to be collaboratively. I, I would think like next, next Thursday, if they're available, maybe like Thursday morning. Mr. Chairman, I will reach out to them and see if they'll be available at Thursday morning. Don, so I said, Don, I'm, I'm just like thinking if we had that chance and we could visit with them, and because then isn't Thursday when we do when we finish ARPA or do ARPA, do the ARPA funding this Thursday? Uh, Mr. Chairman, I think that would work very well on the schedule. Yeah, so if we did that maybe Thursday morning before we jump that dove in, so we had we we, we had the most most recent confusion clear in our minds. So Kevin, <laughs> when CLA provide you opinions on each particular project. They provide responses in writing. In other words, I think it would be helpful for us if we could read some of those because it will, you can see the rationale and the language that they're reviewing and how they came up with it because that'll help us in, the, in our own process. Mr. Chairman, as soon as, for example, with the, uh, <clears throat> with the, CAFCON, I've got that. There was that one, and it doesn't look like we can do the veterans home. But with the courts, as soon as that comes in, uh, I'll have it with LSO and Elizabeth. So that direct line of communication we want to have open. There's no resistance to that. The only thing that we need to understand is, is that Clifton Larson Allen is a recommendation from a consultant outside of state government, and the AG's opinion has to be uh, inside the, the, the chain of communications and ultimately client privilege is a little bit of a challenge between what Clifton Larson Allen wants to have uh, a share versus what the attorney general is going to say as a final answer. Well, and, and the attorney general isn't always the final answer for us. 
I understand that. <laughs> Mr. Chairman, yeah. I, yeah. I do understand that. We're, we're, yeah. but I just wanted to represent that there's, a, there's that hook inside of there that yeah. we, we, we need to understand that the AG, there's a, a significant uh, responsibility that I, I don't want to uh, cast aside. Yeah, we're we're going to do the budget with the best information we have, and, and we'll see if we can give you a little wiggle room to keep us all out of a halt. Total hot water, but we'll just do the best information with it. Yeah, do the best we can with the best information we have at the time. And I think it's easy enough just to say, you know, uh, move it from one pot to the other pot. Yeah. All right. I think I asked you, but does the um, family services new computer system? That looks to me like it fits. Mr. Chairman, um, like it, there's it, evidence it. out there that other states attempted to do that. It wasn't wasn't pretty. And the other thing is, is that there's a matching on that significant federal match on that. We, and I should have said earlier when you asked the question earlier about uh, the conversation that we had earlier with the uh, other one, and I'll think of it here just today, the federal match is an issue on that other, the, the, the FMAP, that those programs have federal match in them as well. So those, those arenas are the ones that we're avoiding. So Right now, we have this presumptive question going out to the agencies, and the main directors were here today for those the, the possible places that we can use for presumptive, and we're chasing that. But you have to understand, the federal match on those programs is is very hard. Now, I think we can get away with it on broadband and a couple in another place with the latest guidance, but everything else, that's really one of the stop signs. It says, "Hey," and by the way, that YCAF has got a significant amount of federal. Road may be slippery when wet. There you go. <laughs> All right. So, Don, what? Take us, take us from us land. What do we, what do we got to do, and and uh, where are we going next? Well, Mr. Chairman, um, if you're uh, comfortable and ready, we have no agencies uh, um, scheduled to appear on Monday, so we would uh, commence um, at your direction uh, with markup of the budget. Um, traditionally, we go through those in agency number order, starting with agency one, the governor's office, uh, on a unit by unit. We have circulated, uh, I believe it's on uh, right on top there with Representative Stiff's um, inbox, which is a 11 page um, summary of every exception request. I think there are 623 of them this year. Um, but I would suggest that the committee continue its old practice of flipping through the budget because there will be narrative and associated comments um, with those. Um, if, if you're moving and proceeding in at a good, good clip, I think uh, goal in the mid fifties. So around, you know, uh, 58. Um, and we'll get through 80 because some of these are going to go fast. That would I be, that would, I think some of that, I think it'll go, I think it's going to go that. I think it's, I think you'll find, find that, Based because the way that these guys prepared the budget, I mean, I, I think it'll, I think we'll be ahead of schedule just like we were going through. But we'll obviously we'll, we'll bog down in a few places as well. So, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Do my best. <laughs> we'll look forward to it, Andy. And, uh, and then on Tuesday, you could easily finish up uh, the remaining agencies. There are a couple that you traditionally have taken in block. And that is the boards and commissions, as well as the district courts, for example. Yeah. Um, and so you, you know, move through 20, 30 agencies at a time. Um, it, it's possible that um, uh, you would be uh, prepared to do the state capital construction on Tuesday afternoon, um, if you're if you're moving quickly. If not, Wednesday morning. Um, and and then there is some. You know, discretion in this, but I would advise uh, walking through the footnotes in section 300 from the old bills, and I've emailed you a copy of all of that. But what I will also do, this one's best to do in hard copy. So on Wednesday morning, um, we'll circulate the hard copy. I have tentatively struck out all of the footnotes that I believe, and it's subjective, that are not necessary or, or it's not a policy decision to continue. For and when did you email that? Um, I email that, uh, I believe, uh, right before the, the Christmas holiday break. So I can resend it. Resend Those it. are long gone. Yeah. yeah. Um, and some of them 
um, are just traditional. Let me just give you an example. Um, the We the People, um, $50,000 or, or $100,000 has been in the budget for about eight or 10 years at least. Um, so it, it is never in the governor's recommendation. It really isn't this year. Um, and, and you can make a, a decision as to whether to continue that um, or not. I have a budget amendment. Well, you don't have to make it now, Andy. I was, I was <laughs> sure you you, if, you, if you're asking Don to remind you, no, that's I'm, fine. Never. It's, pro it's probably already in there. It's probably already in there. Yeah. You, see, you can wait and see if we we're smart enough to take it out. Don put it in there for you. Uh, and, and Mr. Chairman, we are taking uh, amendments. You don't have to share your amendments with us. Um, some members do just be, um, they want to know what unit would be appropriate in, in a complex agency um, or they want a reminder. Um, so we do have a list yeah. of uh, potential budget amendments. Um, we send all those to me. <laughs> some of the members may not. With a, with a, copy, with a, copy, with a copy to me too, yeah. please. <laughs> I, just to give you a sense, we have 32 of them. Um, uh, on our list right now. And so who, has, who has the most? Who wins the prize? It's pretty close. <laughs> <laughs> okay. And that's the same old thing. If you remember, we get, you know, we can, you know, you can take timeouts, you can, you know, you have time, you can slow us down if we're going too fast, all that stuff when we start the markup. We'll talk about that again Monday a little bit, but, you know, and it'll, we'll start out slow and hopefully pick up speed. And then at the end of the day on, on Wednesday, um, you could do your round robin then, or if you wanted to do it after your ARP discussion, because there might be some overlap. I'm guessing after. Mr. Chairman. Mr. Chairman, is Wednesday also the day we're scheduled to tour some facilities at the university? Uh, mm -hmm. So ending a little early would be good. Uh, that, is, that is correct. I think I've, I've uh, shared that invitation on, on their behalf. Um, so I think one of the issues that we're going to have is if we finish, by the time we put all this together and we're gonna to try to be done Thursday with the ARPA bills, I just can't imagine that we're not gonna to wanna to do some sort of a round robin on the ARPA bills as well. And the question is when and how, is that that four hour meeting or what we talked about this later, a week or two later? Uh, 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 yeah, just, uh, just an online, Zoom in meeting yeah. for a round robin to before we so give us a chance to digest what happens with our yeah, <clears throat> come back and finish that off. Yeah. <laughs> we'll see. I mean, we'll, we'll, I, we'll just, yeah, I mean, I don't know why we wouldn't do that. I just, but, I, but what I want to do is obviously we want to have this goals to have these because it's have on their desks day one, yeah. lay down their desk when they get here on the 12th. <laughs> All right. Sounds like a fun. And so, what happens if we don't finish Thursday? Uh, can we work Friday? You can absolutely. You have the the budget <laughs> and the authority to to do so. You could work on Saturday if that becomes um, necessary. <laughs> Bite your tongue. Okay. I like the way you think. Um, keep in mind, you you do have uh, at least um, two bills as well that we'll find some time for, uh, depending on their drafting. I think the. Um, the fire, uh, the fire fee bill and the EGI bill were both being um, uh, revised prior to your consideration. Okay. See you later, Larry. Be careful. Drive carefully. Is it taking the long way? Huh? Is it really close? Yeah. Just between here and Laramie? Yeah. And so it's going to be a wreck. Hopefully. On Happy Jack, too? And, and after. Into Laramie. Wait, wait, can you get on to Happy Jack? No, Happy Jack. Well, you can, they give us mm -hmm. the magic. <laughs> what did oh. you say? <laughs> Okay. Where do you where do you get the happy pet the magic pets? 
I thought, okay. Yeah, I used to have the phone number you called, but it's a different direction. <laughs> Unless there anything, is there anything else? Don, Kevin, anything else? Anything else, members? Okay, thanks for your, all your hard work. Drive carefully, and we'll see you Monday at, at 8 a.m. Okay.